Can I welcome everyone to the 16th meeting of the Education and Skills Committee in 2018? And can I please remind everyone present to turn their mobile phones and other devices onto silent for the duration of the meeting? The first item of business is an evidence session on the attainment and achievement of school aged children experiencing poverty inquiry. Before we start, I would like to put on record my thanks to everyone who attended our meeting at the Muir House Millennium Centre in North Edinburgh last Wednesday. All the members that attended found the discussion very useful. This meeting is the fifth and final evidence session on this inquiry, and we have two panels today. The first panel is Education Scotland, and can I welcome to this meeting Gail Gorman, Chief Inspector of Education and Chief Executive, Elizabeth Morrison, the Interim Strat Strategic Director, Louise Turnbull, HM Inspector and Interim Assistant Director, and Gail Coatland, Attainment Advisor, Education Scotland. I should say to the panel from the outset that if you would like to respond to a question, Please indicate to me or the clerks, and I will call you to speak. And Ms Gorman, I understand you'd like to make a short statement. Thank you. Good Thank morning, you. colleagues. Um, I really welcome the opportunity to discuss uh, this topic with the committee. As you know, the issue of poverty and attainment is a priority for everyone who works in education. I'm joined today by my three colleagues who work directly in this area and will be able to give you first-hand evidence and testimony about the work that's going on across Scotland. Um, improving attainment is at the heart of the new role and remit we're rolling out for Education Scotland and both our curriculum specialists and inspectors are focused on this key priority work across Scotland. Um, our inspectors are discussing PETH planning and impact with school leaders who are aware of how to monitor and gather robust evidence on the interventions and the impact of outcomes on Scotland's children. In some cases, our school leaders are indicating early evaluation of the implementation is showing positive impact on children and young people. And we are gathering through our inspections evidence that we're reiterating in our inspection reports. Through a wide range of channels that we have support for teachers and schools across Scotland, such as GLOW, the National Improvement Hub, and our Interventions for Inquiry, our curriculum teams are gathering evidence from schools and practitioners, sharing that, those examples of interesting practice so that we can spread best practice and impactful work across all classrooms in Scotland. There's still a gap between the progress which is being made by those living in Scotland's least and most deprived areas. Tackling the poverty-related attainment gap is an issue for every school and every local authority in Scotland and one of the highest priorities. Um, we recognise, though, that education alone can't solve um, this deep-rooted societal problem. Effective partnerships, multi-agency with health, social work, uh, NHS, community learning and other third sector organisations are essential and we're seeing more and more of that as a coherent package at school level. Education Scotland will continue to improve the reach and impact of our work. Um, there's a team of named attainment advisors for each local authority currently. Those will be working more collegiately across teams and regional improvement collaboratives to share best practice, to share learning and to connect schools about the impact um, of working in this challenging area. Through all these activities, we'll continue to prioritise improving attainment, reflecting our new vision for Education Scotland, working for Scotland's children with Scotland's educators. And we welcome this opportunity to discuss this important area with you this morning. Thank you. Uh, a couple of things. We have a lot to get through today, so I ask that both the questions and answers today be succinct. That was nothing to do with your statement, by the way. Uh, but before I invite questions from my colleagues, I would like to ask, what today have you seen uh, are the best interventions in school to support children who experience poverty? And what have you been doing to help roll them out? And I know you, you mentioned some of that there. Um, we're gathering lots and lots of evidence of best practice across Scotland. There is no one element that um, will in itself in a unique way raise our uh, attainment and reduce the poverty related attainment gap because it's about the best support at a local level and what works in one school with one group of children and young people may not work in another. Some of it is transferable and some of it isn't. So what we're looking at is international evidence. We're looking at Scottish evidence. We're looking at the impact and feedback that we're getting from our attainment advisors who are able to recommend and to share what's working well across Scotland but that has to be tailored and made bespoke for the children and young people in each individual context. But my colleagues involved in, in PEF could tell you a little bit more around that. Thank you. As Gail said already, it is about those local responses um, and schools working with their partners to identify a really clear rationale for the different interventions that they put in place. Um, and we have many, many examples across Scotland of things that are happening. So, for example, in Labert, Labert High School, 
The staff there have worked to use their PEF funding alongside their NIF support team to look at a real to the general oh, public sorry. and committee Apologies. members what NIF is. The <laughs> National Improvement Framework. So it's a team of people who have specific roles with the National Improvement Framework, as well as a team of people who are working within um, supporting PEF and the development of PEF. So they've been looking at a multi-layered approach, and that multi-layered approach has looked at interrogating the data they already had, identifying what their gaps were, and therefore identifying the needs, and then working together with their partners to identify the interventions they feel will make the biggest difference. And what they've done is look at training their support for learning assistants to be able to deliver high quality to support in English and maths lessons, small targeted support alongside training older learners in peer support, alongside staff training of pedagogical approaches and learning and teaching and how they develop that. Um, and in addition to that, they've also appointed a welfare <coughs> officer to improve attendance. So that multi-layer approach, looking at the needs of their local authority. And the impact that they've had in relation to that are really strong outcomes in relation to well-being for their learners. Highly effective approaches to inclusion, equity and equality. And in their recent inspection, almost all of their young people said that they were well supported and that they were able to achieve good example of PEF. Now, there's a lot of uh, my colleagues are going to be asking questions around about PEF uh, later on, so I'd rather not dwell on it uh, at this stage. So what I'll do is I'll just start, I'll move on to the, the rest of the committee. Richard, you wanted to come in. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> Can you just give us a flavour of what you believe to be the impact of poverty on education in Scotland in terms especially of attainment? The impact of poverty on, on children across Scotland? Yes. yes. What's yes. the view of your organisation? Sorry, I'm not quite clear what you're asking. Well, are you asking about Education Scotland and what we're doing, or are you asking about the impact on children? If you just clarify So the, the impact on children, what's, what's Education Scotland's view of the impact of poverty on children? Thank you. Thank you for clarifying. Um, that there is significant difference. Our results and our, our data across Scotland would show us that while there is significant improvement um, in areas, and actually children from our most deprived areas are making rapid improvement, accelerated progress, we would call it, and we're seeing a significant improvement in core areas there, that actually there still is um, an, an attainment and achievement gap between our most deprived um, uh, children uh, and actually those with least deprivation. So we are seeing that there's an impact in terms of um, the vocabulary gap, in terms of um, their core skills around literacy and numeracy, and um, their confidence in terms of approaches to learning. Um, but we do have, you know, we are beginning to see that impact. And over three quarters of head teachers reported recently that they're feeling confident that the work in this area of the, the Scottish Attainment Challenge is actually beginning to have impact. And 90, over 90% 90 of head teachers are saying that they feel that they are going to see significant impact in the next five years. So we do see it. We do see it in terms of attitude to learning willingness to learn, the ability, the vocabulary gap. Um, but we are seeing significant impact beginning to move through the system as this becomes a core feature of school improvement plans across Scotland. Some of my colleagues may talk, want to talk about specific examples that show how that's moving forward. Gail, I don't know. Thank you. Um, in my work as the attainment advisor in Western Barton, um, I'd like to speak to you about uh, the approaches to learning through play. Um, this initiative has been funded by the Scottish Attainment Challenge and focusing mainly on the vocabulary gap for children in that area. Um, all early years workers and the primary one teachers received extensive training in Word Aware. It was focused on the key words and it used a research-based approach to developing literacy. As a result of that, there was a 100% increase in performance in the children living in SIMD 1 and 2. To involve the families, they introduced a text messaging service whereby they alerted the parents to the word of the week. And as a result, there has been a significantly, statistically significant increase in the results of their assessments. Okay. I'm only, my second question, final question, is just in terms of the inspections and your duties in that regard. A lot of the evidence we've had from other witnesses is that poverty is rising and having a greater impact over the last few years. And we've had lots of um, teachers and other organisations giving us evidence about that. So when you're out inspecting the schools, 
Um, are there any trends you've identified or, or, or have you come across those kinds of issues? Um, thank you very much for that. Um, when we are out in inspection, then we do see the impact of poverty. Um, Gail has um, described how we see the impact of poverty in terms of attainment and achievement. And while across Scotland um, we are making um, significant progress in, in closing that attainment gap, and we're seeing really emerging um, positive impact of, of the work that's being do, done through the Scottish Attainment Challenge, but inevitably, when we are in inspection and we're looking at the attainment, then we see the gap. We, we know it's there. We know it's not good enough, but we're working very hard. And what we also see in inspection is we see a lot of very, very hard-working teachers right across Scotland who are really making a difference for individual children, individual young people, and actually supporting them to achieve and attain as highly. Um, we're also seeing the impact at, at the other end because we're seeing more of our young people um, from areas of deprivation going on to university, um, which is, is really, really positive. We're seeing more of our leavers from areas of deprivation going on to positive and sustained destinations. And we're seeing the impact um, at um, Scottish Credit and Qualification Frameworks at levels four, five and six, where the attainment gap is narrowing. So... Yes, we do see it, but actually we're, what we're more pleased with is that we're seeing the progress that's being made to address that. And if, if I could just add, um, in inspections, what we are seeing is an increased use of uh, performance data. So looking at children's performance data, the use of pupil, uh, pupil tracking, where schools are becoming much more familiar with the um, strengths and weaknesses in a child's learning so that they can then target the next step in learning and we're seeing school leaders use that much more effectively to target intervention and resources and that's becoming a recurrent theme across the last 18 month, uh, months through our inspection reports and we're finding that um, in terms of imp using, uh, improving attainment using teaching and learning approaches, much more focused, much sharper in terms of also evaluating when to stop doing something. So looking at the impact on learners pretty early on, trying an intervention, seeing the impact of it, being aware of it, monitoring it, evaluating it, and if it's the wrong thing, adjusting it to meet the needs of, of children and young people. And there's been a real significant focus in, in the classroom activity we're observing and the senior leadership discussions, their understanding of individual pupil progress. Okay. Can, can I just ask one very brief question then on the... the um Inspections, the, you say that you find all these great teachers doing great work, which I have got absolutely no doubt. Do their inspections show that? Do their inspection reports show that? Because one of the, the pieces of evidence we found in another piece of work was that inspections seem to concentrate on the negative as opposed to the positive, you know, what you still need to achieve as opposed to what you have achieved. And, I mean, given what you've just said and which I, we all are aware of, are the inspections starting to show that? Um, what we see on inspection is that um, we see um, a lot of strengths in inspection. And, you know, I've mentioned the very hard work and the, the impact that it's having on learners. Um, what we would say is that people sometimes focus um, unduly on the negatives. Um, we naturally identify areas for strength. There are lots of areas for strength in terms of we're seeing um, across Scotland in terms of leadership, in terms of the experience young people have, the wider achievement, which has been a, a real um, progress within Scotland, the opportunities in the senior phase to do um, Duke of Edinburgh's awards, to do... Um, modern foundation apprenticeships and um, so we're seeing a, a much wider so we recognize all them um, but naturally um, everybody can improve and um, we, we identify areas for improvement well I really meant the report as opposed to the, the inspections to the report highlight the good work that's going on as opposed to sometimes concentrating on negative but you know, I'm happy. To, I'm happy to move on. We have got a lot to go through today. Uh, if I could just just come back briefly, briefly, briefly on that, I'm aware of the time. You know, if we think of the sample of 120 national improvement framework schools that we sampled last academic year between August and June, 92% of the schools are evaluated satisfactory or better. Um, 
and that's for raising attainment and achievement. So we are celebrating that. In each inspection report, we clearly have areas of strength and we have areas for development um, because actually inspection's about an improvement, improving process. So we certainly um, would want to emphasise that the, the paperwork, the discussions, and fundamentally the evaluation that head teachers send back to us following an inspection talks about the quality of the professional learning that's taken place during that process as being one of the best in their career and it's highly evaluated. So it's part of that improvement dialogue that those discussions would take place and we certainly want to celebrate, as Liz said, the quality of the hard work that goes on every day in classrooms across Scotland. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Ruth and then Liz. Thank you, convener. Good morning, panel. Um, one of the things that's, that's become clear during our inquiry is the importance of um, teachers understanding how poverty impacts on pupils and their attainment and achievement. Um, could you just set out for the, the committee what materials Education Scotland um, provides um, in that way? And also, um, in terms of your um, CPD, what um, programmes there are, professional learning programmes for teachers on that topic? Yeah, I'll kick off with an opening statement and my colleagues will be able to go into some of the, some of the detail and specifics. Um, we've, uh, you know, as across Scotland, many of, of, of our colleagues have as well, we've very much been talking to all schools, school leaders and teachers, particularly around adverse childhood experiences and um, the impact of those on children's learning. Um, there's been significant professional learning and CPD across the country at local authority level, at regional improvement collaborative level and from Education Scotland to um, bring together the professionals, so social workers, health workers, allied health professionals, to bring together their professional knowledge to upskill um, education teams around the impact of trauma, the impact of chaotic lifestyles and some of the issues that children and young people bring to school with them, um, a significant uh, an important factor in, in supporting their attainment and achievement. So we've done significant work on that with a range of conferences recently, which are hugely oversubscribed jointly with the NHS. Um, Education Scotland and NHS looking and working with teachers and practitioners at how you work collectively to address these issues and make teachers more aware of some of the challenges young people face on, on a daily basis. But my colleagues can say a little bit more. Thank you very much. Um, if I can come in then, um, I th one of the things that I want to focus on is that um, Education Scotland as an organisation is moving away from um, creating masses and masses of, of stuff that we're putting on a website that is, is not meaningful. And as an organisation, um, we're moving towards working alongside um, with teachers, with other practitioners in the classroom. So it's very much um, working on the ground, if you like. And Gail is, is a very good example of this. So that we actually roll up our sleeves and work with teachers um, to actually improve outcomes for children and young people. Um, having said all, all that, we, we do have on our National Improvement Hub, we do have a wide variety of information. Um, some of that is, is gathered um, as a result of inspection processes and is good practice. Um, we also share a lot of information from some of the very good work that's happening in our local authorities. Um, so an example of that would be that Edinburgh City Council did a, a one in five project, which was really focused on the one in five children in, in Edinburgh City Council who were living in poverty. And they produced a very helpful document, um, tips for teachers to actually support teachers directly um, looking at and working with children who were living in poverty and we are able to share that nationally which means that every teacher in the country has access to that material. Um, I'll maybe pass to my colleague Louise. Thank you. Um, in addition to that, you'll be aware that the Scottish College for Educational Leadership has also become part of Education Scotland and all of their programmes, the Framework for Educational Leadership, um, the Teacher Leadership Programme, all have elements which address teachers' understanding of poverty and the impact that poverty has. Um, we've mentioned already a lot of national support, but we also provide a lot of that support locally through the role of the Attainment Advisor. And the Attainment Advisor is a, is a very unique role because those um, 
Colleagues who, who work in that role work both in the classroom with learners and with teachers. They work in the schools with head teachers and senior leaders, but they also work strategically with local authorities to develop that shared understanding of the impact of poverty, but also in that hands-on way, as Elizabeth has already said. Um, the attainment advisor role is a crucial part of supporting um, cl closing the poverty-related attainment gap. And that role will change and be different depending on where different people work. But there's that real focus on developing understanding and career-long professional learning as part of that. And I'll pass over to Gail to give you a specific. Thank you very much. Um, without doubt, um, working in schools with head teachers, teachers and children is by far the highlight of the role of an attainment advisor. And in my work in Western Bartonshire, I work alongside the improvement team. We have a, I have a very clear role um, in supporting the improvement team and also work in individual schools and across all the schools in Western Bartonshire. It gives me the opportunity to see how well the interventions are working, to hear what people are saying on the ground and to hear what teachers are saying and to share with these people the national messages. It also gives me the opportunity to identify the good practice that's going on in Western Bartonshire and that opportunity to share with the other attainment advisors at team meetings. We've also presented at national events um, to celebrate the success in Western Bartonshire. So working on the ground with teachers and children is by far one of the highlights of the job. Okay. That's fine for my convener, thanks. Liz and then George, and, and can I just remind you that we don't need every member of the panel answering every question because we layered approach yeah, across Scotland. No, that and, was an and, example. and I do appreciate that. Appreciate just, we've got an awful lot to get through. Just one question just now, convener. Can I ask uh, the panel's opinion as to whom a head teacher is accountable when he or she makes a decision about how to spend PEF money? Money for PEF is, was designed to go to schools and to work um, entirely at local level. And so school head teachers and classroom teachers themselves as well are best placed to, to make the decisions about the choices that they have. Accountable is what I was asking. They're accountable to the children and families that they, they have within their school. Nobody else? Well, they would be accountable in terms of best value practice for, uh, to a local authority, but actually the PEF funding, we've got very clear guidance that was produced that went out to schools to um, support their work and to make sure that they are making local decision making. Sorry, can that, I, can, sorry to interrupt you. Can I just be absolutely clear? The guidelines come from yourselves or from local authorities? Um, there's a combination of guidelines because um, some local authorities have been asked by head teachers to work collectively to help them um, with some of the challenges around procuring and working and, and gathering the resources that they wish to buy if there's a number of schools who want to take part in that. Others, um, local authorities have, have provided best practice models such as Western Bartonshire and others. And there's also guidance that's come out from Scottish Government around funding as well as the PEF um, case studies and the approaches that we've put out because what we're wanting to do is put some information in the system for schools to learn from best practice and to make those decisions at a local level about the children and families they have in front of them. That is entirely um, the focus of, of PEF funding, money for schools for that local decision making. Okay, thank you. That means there are quite a lot of lines of accountability. Thank you. Uh, Joanne and, oh, sorry, George and then Joanne. Good morning. Uh, I'd just like to ask uh, one of the questions on, we've had the past, we've had a couple of years now of the attainment challenge, can I ask, uh, sounds a simple question, probably not because of that, but uh, what have been the challenges that you've faced over these two years? How did Education Scotland address them? And uh, what have you learned over that period that you can take forward? Uh, thank you. Um, we face, as you say, we faced a number of challenges. Um, as you know, we're in a, a very um, good position now in that we're recruiting a number of staff, um, but we have had to move staff around and, and that has, has been a challenge to us. Um, we've been very fortunate in that we've just um, given or issued contracts to 10 new attainment advisors who are permanent appointments, which will really help to support us going forward. Um, and we're recruiting um, in the next few weeks. Um, Gail and I are going to be interviewing a, a number of, of people who have come with, with very high... Um, um, application forms so we'll be interviewing the, these candidates so we hope to be able to appoint more um, but 
we have had a challenge with ensuring that um, we come together. But as an organisation, um, we took a collective responsibility to actually come together to ensure that we met the challenge of um, the Scottish Entertainment Challenge and ensured that every authority um, had a named person that they could refer to. In terms of the, the progress on, on the um, attainment challenge as over the last uh, couple of years, um, what we've seen was, you know, a, a kind of um, a scaling up, if you like, in terms of people's engagement with the programme. So there was a lot of information that had to be given at the beginning, a lot of confidence building around the approaches and, and how to develop that and the expectations of schools. And over the piece, we're now seeing that confidence growing and some of those challenges around, you know, what are the expectations? How will this be measured? What are people looking for? Where are the gaps in our school? The knowledge, the teacher subject knowledge and the understanding of the expectations and the focus around it has you know, was one of the areas we developed at the beginning and is now actually gaining momentum and moving forward quite confidently. Louise, you might want to talk about some of the work that's kind of grown and emerged over the last two years. Yeah, I, mean, I think absolutely there are always ongoing challenges in education, but as Elizabeth's already said, it's about how we've worked together as an organisation. And one of the, the big things that um, I think has been a real success of that is the increased focus and collaboration. So schools and local authorities being supported to collaborate within their local authority to support each other, to provide that challenge as well as that support, but also that collaboration between the attainment advisors and the local authorities, but also that partnership with uh, Scottish government and the attainment advisor has been a pivotal role in being able to support that collaboration and also develop and extend collaboration with partners and um, so that obviously takes time to, to develop and embed but we're really now beginning to see real impact in those areas and as we move forward into new regional models then that collaboration is as important and if not more I'm, I'm sold on attainment advisors in uh, the areas uh, across Scotland. But one of the things I want to say, where, where's the join-up between the actual frontline education, the attainment advisor? You know, how, how is their role, how's education school role, uh, Scotland's role and the attainment advisor role? With We had like, Nancy Clooney in from Dunwarnock Primary. Now, she was dynamic, go get them, created a, created a community herself. Not everybody's going to have that same personality. Not everybody's going to be that same person. But how do you as an organisation and the attainment advisors, who I think would be key in this, how do they become that link that gets that expertise from the likes of Nancy and others that work in the industry and make sure that it kind of, we, we get it, not uniform, but we can get that kind of delivery throughout Scotland? Um, well, I, I think we're in, as I say, we're in this very... Um, a positive situation at the moment where we are recruiting and I think one of the things that will be key when we get our, our 10 new people in and we're hoping to recruit and probably another 10 people from this round of recruitment when we get these people together then the induction um, will be absolutely critical so we've got plans for an induction process so that we actually build on some of the excellent practice we're seeing with, with Gale and West and Bartonshire and we actually challenge our new people to come together but we're also looking at in terms of uh, working as teams across regional improvement collaboratives um, so that we take a blend of skills right across the collaborative and people who maybe primarily work with one local authority will be using their skills and experience and sharing that right across the improvement collaborative. Um, so I think we're in, in a, a really exciting and dynamic situation to do that. Um, what we also um, need to do is build on the experience that we've got um, with our current attainment advisors um, and look at some of the ways they've worked. So for example, you, you mentioned some of the challenges and one of the challenges that we've had was to do with consistency of, of teacher professional judgment and we've done a huge amount of work and attainment advisors have done a huge amount of work um, in terms of getting groups of teachers together <clears throat> to look at moderation, to bring samples of children's work and actually share that right across so that we get a real solid understanding of the, of the standards. capturing that practice how do we share that and how do we support people to do that um, obviously we can't be, be um, taking one thing and transferring it somewhere else but what we do is we use our national improvement hub as our online resource to be able to capture some of that practice so that people can learn with and from each other and the attainment advisors are critical people in gathering that ex expertise and experience 
We then share it as Education Scotland nationally and the attainment advisors work together. We come together regularly to be able to build on those examples, be able to signpost head teachers and schools to that good practice um, and be able to make connections so that um, somebody can go in and visit Nancy and learn from Nancy and have those conversations with her. So we have a role there in connecting people to be able to share that experience. Okay. okay. Thank you, George. Joanne? Um, thank you very much. Um, can I just say, first of all, I mean, I hear what you say about the good things that are happening, but I am very struck between the gap between what you're saying about how well things are and all of what we hear going round as a committee listening to teachers, parents and in our own communities. And I think there is, with respect, a gap there. And I don't know whether maybe you're constrained in what you can say about government policy since you're implementing it and inspecting it. But I would say that the experience of, that we've had of speaking to professionals who are working in education and families, that it doesn't feel like that. You're talking about having 10 more attainment advisors at a time when there are fewer teachers, fewer support teachers and support staff in schools. And I wonder if you're aware of that gap between what you think is going on and what is, is being said um, within the school, uh, education community. Um, interesting. I, I, I... I'm out in schools on a regular basis and, and continue to be out in schools on a regular basis and um, I don't recognise the, the conversations that, that you're reflecting there. The evidence that we have in conversations and discussions uh, with my, my hard-working colleagues is that they are absolutely focused on children and young people, they're dedicated to that and they are working very hard to make a difference. Relaxed education. I'm suggesting they're not given the support they require to do their job. Can I maybe? That's certainly not the, the, what what I would recognise. I think that there is a, a need for further support and professional learning. That's why we're developing mm -hmm. a new and enhanced Education mm -hmm. Scotland in terms of an offer for children and young people and their teachers. Mm -hmm. We want to continue to do that. But that's why the focus that Liz mentioned earlier about working directly in schools with people like attainment advisors, but others, we're widening our curriculum team. We're widening the support for teachers with, with around this, literacy and numeracy uh, to respect, enable that frontline support respect, to be there. People are not saying, I wish we had more support from Education Scotland. They're saying, I wish we had more staff and support staff in the schools. Can I just maybe raise a question around PEF? Because, with, again, with respect to Louise Turnbull, I was interested in the example she gave of PEF funding. But these were all things that were, I would have regarded as mainstream in my job 20 years ago that there'd be somebody who was a home links teacher, somebody who supported individual young people that trained staff to be aware of special needs. And do you share my concern that potentially what we're seeing is PEF funding being a, is substituting for what would in the past have been mainstream provision? Um, in terms of, of PEF funding, what we're seeing is that schools are making those local decisions about where they feel they want additional capacity and additional reach. So and that would, varies would, from one you, school to in another. In your inspections, you would explore the reality if there were a reality that people were using it to substitute for a loss of funding, that would be come out in your report. So if somebody decides that they're going to, through PF, PF funding, mm -hmm. fund something which in the past was funded through mainstream resources, you would highlight that and say it was unacceptable. We, in our inspection framework, How Good Is Our School, fourth version, are looking at the impact on attainment on, and achievement for children and young people, and that's what we would be reporting mm -hmm, on. But that's not we what would I be, asked you, with respect. But you asked me if I report, if in an inspection we would report on whether they were using that. What we would be reporting on is its impact on children and young people's attainment. Right. And we wouldn't, it, it would not be for education in Scotland inspection teams because they wouldn't know the previous capacity of the school. So they would know whether there's an effective model being delivered now and a strong model of leadership okay. and capacity to improve, okay. which we is what we would look at. We could establish that it's good practice to have support staff supporting teachers with young people with additional support needs. There's evidence for that. We know that. That was in the past in a school funded by the local authority. That stops and the PEF money is used to put somebody in to do that job. Is that an acceptable use of PEF money? As I said, it's about the local uh, local context for the head teacher, and so therefore it would be looking at what is the suite that's offered for those children and young people. How does that fit from the offer that they're getting in terms of their local authority funding, the local decision making and democracy processes around the funding per capita, around additional support funds? 
that would be um, the local process that takes place. Inspection is focused on the role of the school, the capacity of the leadership to improve and raise and improve attainment and achievement for all Scotland's mm -hmm. learners. That's what the inspection process would look so, at. So it's clear then Education Scotland is incapable or unable, not incapable is the wrong word, my apologies, is unable because of its role to comment on the impact of government policy in funding local authorities and what's happening within our local schools. You, you follow government policy and then you inspect it. Is that right? No, um, we actually are, are about improvement. Education Scotland is an improvement service. It's about supporting Scotland's teachers and learners to improve outcomes for children across Scotland. And we are, through our inspection, we are looking at an inspection as part of the scrutiny process for improving outcomes for children. It is not our job to, to focus on policy delivery mm, through so inspection. We are very much clear that that's an independent process about improvements in the school, improvements for learners, and an improvement journey, as well as the other suite of opportunity that we use So my last point scrutiny. is, it wouldn't be possible for you to say that you believed the best way of uh, securing improvement in our schools is to resource local authorities in a different way. You couldn't, you wouldn't, I mean, accept it maybe. It wouldn't be for me to comment on that. that. That certainly wouldn't be for me to comment. Okay, uh, Gillian, then Tavish. Thank you very much, convener. I'd like to talk about um, teaching approaches and what you've found out. So we've, we've got a situation where PEF funding has been given to schools, but of course, as you, right, as you rightly say, it's up to the head teacher and the school team to decide how to use that funding. However, um, there may be, I mean, and speaking to some, some, some people, particularly in the third sector who've been involved with, with, with schools, um, there's a concern there that that PEF funding might not be used in the most appropriate or, or, or best way, or might not involve partners, or a head teacher might have very traditional views about how about teaching and learning. Um, how, how do we how do we approach that? I mean, it, there's the individual choice of the head teacher, and they're the leader of the school. But when PEF funding has maybe been used in a way that's maybe not tackling attainment, um, how, how do we deal with that? So recently there's been a round of seven um, uh, PEF events um, around Scotland, bringing together head teachers, deputy heads, third set, other, other partners, where actually there have been a series of workshops run of best practice from schools themselves, sector led, um, about, and many of them featured third, third sector partnerships or joint multi-agency work with social work or, or, or other agencies. So that's certainly the model. On um, line, on Twitter, we've been, uh, there's been a kind of national every day for the last hundred days, a tweet about a school that's and what they're doing with PEF money, many of whom are beyond some of those traditional methods you, you, you may be thinking of. It's about you know looking wider, particularly um, to support you know some of the the community work that that's going on. But my colleagues are able to give some examples of what's happening with that and how we're addressing it. Thank you very much. Um, going back to your um, point about Im improving learning and teaching, in, in my experience in Western Bartonshire, the head teachers are totally focused in using their PEF money to raise attainment and to narrow the poverty-related attainment gap. But they're using it creatively and in an innovative and exciting way, not only for the, the teachers in terms of their professionalism, but for, above all for the children and involving parents. And one of the examples from Western Bartonshire was it, um, celebrated at the national event um, from Leaven Vale Primary, where they used part of their PEF funding to provide a residential experience for families focused completely on developing literacy skills and parents and children were involved all weekend in learning together, both indoors and outdoors. The parents were completely involved in all aspects of that work and through partner, effective partnership working with um, the family support worker, um, they reported that the relationships with the parents had significantly improved. The family support worker said that she made better connections with the families than she would have achieved in a year. But above all, the parents gained confidence in supporting the children at home with literacy. Copies of the books were provided for every family. And as a result, this year, we're seeing a significant increase in using the school library by parents and children. So that's a really positive experience. And obviously, you're working very hard in Western Bartonshire. Across the whole of Scotland, though, of course, we might not all be at, at, that, at that stage. And what's the role of Education Scotland here in um, 
ensuring that there's best practice and giving support to schools that are maybe just not not really. Um, uh, we heard a few people saying in some of our focus groups that there was a bit of nervousness about how to spend the money and who to go to, and they didn't want to sort of like spend it in one area if it it wasn't going to work and, and, and almost like feeling accountable to, to, to the community about how they use that funding. What support do you give them? Do you actually directly suggest partnership uh, working? Um, actually, at the PEF events, we launched an uh, Education Scotland guide to working with the third sector that we'd written um, in partnership with third sector colleagues, which was about how to work, how for, a guide for head teachers and senior leaders about how to work and how to engage and who to contact um, to support their PEF and the sort of range of activities that, that would be available. So we actually launched that and shared that um, at the, the PEF events, but Liz might say more. Um, I, I was going to mention uh, the work in terms of the Education Endowment Foundation and I think you heard from a representative at, at one of the previous committee meetings. So um, Scottish Government and ourselves invested in the Education Endowment Foundation and we now have a Scottish version of the Teaching and Learning Toolkit on our National Improvement Hub. And that gives a very simple um, way of, and it's very easy to access for teachers that they can look at various interventions which are um, international, which are Scottish, um, and increasingly Scottish, so they can actually look and see the impact of a particular intervention and look at the cost of that intervention. So with that, they can very easily see, if I use my PEF money for this, what sort of is, is the likely impact for the amount of money that it's going to cost me? And it, it, um, we've promoted it very heavily um, at the PEF events that, that various people have mentioned. We had somebody from the Education Endowment Foundation actually speak at all the PEF events to actually raise awareness of this. Um, we also have the team advisors when they're out um, working with schools, they're encouraging staff, they're actually using it with staff in schools so that they can actually make informed um, decisions about, about their spending. But we need to be clear that spending needs to be based on a, a clear rationale for why they're going to spend it and what their self-evaluation is telling them um, about the needs of, of their local context and the needs of, of the learners within their establishment. And I just finally want to ask around <clears throat> some of the traditional practices around school education that you might find that actually have a negative effect on families. For example, um, maybe families that have a, a, a lifestyle that, you know, maybe single parent families that are maybe struggling to, to keep down a couple of jobs, whatever, for whom like having to go to the school at a certain point, that really seriously impact on, on, on their, their day, causes considerable stress. Um, Things like homework, things like um, uh, interventions for the school to get the parent in at a point which is very inconvenient for them, given that they're, you know, all, all these things that we talked about, cost the school uniform, all these things, these very traditional, very set, schools can be quite set in their ways about how they do things. What is the role for Education Scotland in getting them to identify and look at different ways of working that might actually support families more that are maybe, maybe struggling with, with the effects of poverty rather than actually adding to their worries. Thank you for that. Um, we've done a lot of work um, as Education Scotland, both locally and nationally, on developing not just parental involvement, but parental engagement in learning, because we recognise that that has a significant impact on children's learning. And one way of being able to support families with that is the development of family learning. Um, we've done a lot of work in relation to working with third sector partners to develop family learning approaches, and Education Scotland have pulled all of that together with some case studies in a review in December 2016. So that pulls together examples of family learning approaches that have been happening across Scotland to be able to support that discussion. As Liz has said already, the EEF and the materials that are there, it's not about lifting an approach, it's about providing that evidence-informed decision-making that schools can then make to, to uh, decide on the best approaches to support them. 
As a result of the work we've been doing around family learning, we recognised that further support was needed and we've recently uh, launched a family learning framework that supports schools to work with their partners and with their parents and their communities to develop a range of approaches, what those approaches might look like, how those approaches might be developed and created in partnership, and also how they might go about evaluating that, that programme and that work. So we absolutely recognise that we need to support that and we've got a role in doing that. Um, through some of that work that I've just uh, described. And those traditional approaches that, that, that maybe have the, the negative effect I've just mentioned, is that the sort of thing that's picked up by attainment advisors and by inspectors when you go in that are going to be areas for development? So while we're on inspection, one of the things we look at is how schools identify barriers to learning, how they overcome those barriers to learning and how they work with their families to do that. So that's something that we would look at as part of our inspection processes. Thank you. Tavish. Thank you very much, Karina. I actually wanted to kind of slightly follow that on um, about the, uh, I suppose, what is more of a traditional approach as to some of our more um, thoughtful schools about uh, non-formal education, the points you made the, in your introduction, Gail, about, uh, about youth work, about um, the pupil in the round, uh, not just the formal education. The thing that uh, head teachers said to me repeatedly while we've been doing this exercise is the, dif is the difficulty of, of uh, accrediting non-formal education in the system so that that helps children and young people who would especially benefit from that, i.e. Duke of Edinburgh and some of the other things you've... What work is Education Scotland doing with SQA to tr and the Scottish Qualifications Framework to bring some of those things into that system so that schools can then see it and use it um, in a way which would be helpful, if I may say so, to the learner and to the young person as much to all of us? something we're fundamentally committed to working in partnership with the agencies you mentioned because we do know the significant role in aspiration and confidence that can give to to our most vulnerable learners but Liz can give you some detail around some work on that thank you thank you for that um it's an area that I'm particularly passionate about because I think we have to recognize the wider achievement in, in a more formal way um, I think over a number of years we have worked with the awards network to actually ensure that that information is being captured um, when we changed to Insight, when we introduced Insight with the new qualifications, then one of the things that was really positive about that was that as well as capturing all the very good results in terms of SQA attainment, we also captured um, all the awards that are um, Scottish Credit and Qualification Frameworks levelled. Um, so that if um, a provider and it providers were supported to go through the levelling process. So if a provider was supported to go through the levelling process, it became part of the Scottish Qualifications and Credit Framework, and therefore it was reported in Insight. So, so uh, that's exactly the point Ted Teachers has been making to me. That's still quite a limited choice for, so, for schools to take up. I, I think, uh, well, um, can I go on to, um, if I just go on. So what, what happened was there was a, a debate in December 2017 where young people actually, it was part of the year of um, young people, um, really wanted um, all their qualifications recognised, all their mm. achievements, all their awards. So we've been working um, with the Awards Network Skills Development Scotland to actually see how we can capture that in a, in, so that we capture everything. Um, and what we've got is that there'll be an online learner account um, of which each young person will have, which will will capture everything. So the work is underway. It's it's at an early stage. Nice, because I mean, you'll keep me right. But the, the the review of youth awards in 2015 said Education Scotland should, and your point about the awards network should extend the use of youth awards and make sure they're registered or, or recognised. Was that what's going to happen? Well, We've done a lot of work in that area, working with the awards network to ensure yeah. that as much as possible is recognised. Um, we've done a lot of work promoting the Duke of Edinburgh, for example, right. which is not SEQF level, but will be recognised under this new online okay. account. Okay. And will schools then, because schools are still judged on, as you rightly said, on insight, and these, a lot of these things don't. So what I'm being told is head teachers will not put money into that, PEF or any attainment money or anything, if it's not part of insight, because... I can quite understand it from a head teacher's point of view. I get, I, I as a head teacher get no benefit for putting it on, despite all the good things it does for young people. 
So you are you trying to close? I, I don't yeah. say this is easy, but are oh, you no, trying to close not. as it were that no. gap? Um, yeah. yeah, I think through the, the network of support that, we, that Liz was talking about, we're working with a lot of the partners who are seeking um, to have that recognition so that they can yeah. get that and it can be registered and okay. then uh, added to the accreditation portfolio and, and be, be used and celebrated. It should be anyway. It's sad that it's not, no, exactly. but the reality yeah. is very much as you, as, as you described. Okay. So we're, we're doing that. We're having ongoing dialogue with SQA and other partners and we would continue to advocate wider learning and the the parity of esteem yes. around that, that wider learning okay. piece. It's really That's important. really helpful. Thank you. I just wanted to also ask, Convener, if I may, um, in your submission to the committee, you gave us the uh, measures of the attainment gap, for which, if I count them up, there are 11. Now, am I getting this right? There are 11 uh, different measures of the attainment gap. Yeah. yeah. And, and none of those relate to this issue. And you'll, you'll give me a good reason as to why that's the case. But is there a good reason? Because should we not be measuring this as well? Um, well, health and well-being, of course, is part of, of, of our yeah. criterion. And much of this work that you're describing would certainly be part of that. Um, and so we are capturing. One of the issues is, is because of some of the issues you've raised, is about the, how we capture that information yeah. nationally. And so this is about looking at national measures and, and national outcomes. And so it was looking at the suite of what we have, but certainly not to undermine the, the, the importance and central, one of the central measures is around health and well-being of young people, of which wider achievement plays a, a significant role. Okay, and, and the 11 measures, how are they actually practically used? I mean, do they, do they, does this stuff go down to head teachers, or, or is this just national stats that people like us obsess about? How do, what difference does this make to a school is really what I'm asking. The, the basket of measures, what we, we recognise is that we can't use one measure to be able to close an attainment gap because as we've just outlined in, in a lot of things that we've talked about and the conversation you've just had we're looking at literacy we're looking at numeracy we're looking at health and well-being we're looking at learners as they move into formal education and, and the learning that takes place there there's a wide range of um things that need to be taken into account of to look at that closing of the poverty related attainment gap the 11 measures that you're referring to are the scottish government measures that are outlined in the national improvement framework and what we are doing is we are working with schools to identify the appropriate measures for them within their schools and with their learners to identify the impact the work's having so we've been uh, specifically looking at through school improvement planning and through pef planning um, what are the What's the rationale, first of all, as Liz mentioned earlier, of particular interventions? And then what is the desired outcome of that intervention? What is it as a school that you want to be different? And by how much? And how will you record that? And how will you measure that? So we've been looking at school measures, school sets of measures. And in fact, one of our um, attainment advisors in Dundee has been working particularly with a group of head teachers around about this just now to identify a range of school measures. So participation, um, evaluation, looking at um, attendance and inclusion and exclusion statistics as part of that, but also looking at fundamentally, if you put this intervention in place, what is the outcome and what will you do to measure that? So we've been doing a lot of work with schools to support that work. That will feed into these national measures because that will feed into teachers' judgment of curriculum for excellence levels, for example, which is one of those 11 measures. Um, so it will increase the robustness of that. It will increase the confidence in those judgments. Um, so we have to look at it mm -hmm. uh, from both um, mm -hmm. ends of that spectrum. What no, will support learners in the classroom sure, and what will gather the national information? Yeah, thank you. Um, but just on money, of course, on the attainment uh, monies that are available, 23 local authorities don't get any attainment monies at all. So I guess what you're arguing is those all those schools in those areas just have to get on with this with, with an attainment advisor. I take your point that you've appointed an attainment advisor in each of those 23 areas, but they've no extra money to do any of this, do they? Well, pupil, pupil equity funding goes to 95% of all schools across Scotland. No, I'm talking about the attainment um, fund there. Talking about what's the sorry? attainment fund, which it's was announced attainment. yesterday. Well, the, the pupil equity fund is part of the overall attainment Scotland fund. Uh -huh. So that the Scottish government has 750 million in attainment Scotland fund over the length of Parliament. Some of that money is through challenge authorities and schools programme, and some of that money is through yeah. pupil equity funding. It all comes from that one pot. But I think probably would be in a position to see Scottish government colleagues would be better placed to discuss the money side. We focus on the education and the improvement side of pupil equity. But fund you can't have one and not the other, <laughs> can you? 
But our focus in terms of Education Scotland is looking at how we support schools to make the biggest difference, to make the educational improvements, um, and to, to choose the right interventions yeah, that make the difference for them. And get all that, one, of, one of the parts of the, of the programme, we, you know, there's kind of three layers, if you like. So there's the, the, the very targeted nine uh, 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 the local authorities that have the Scottish Attainment Challenge money. There's then the 74 schools who are not in those authorities, who don't have, you know, who are not funded authorities. And then there's the universal offer which is, as you stated, about you know, the attainment advisors, but also about training, events, access to networking and collaboration and some of the support work that will develop over time and is already in some areas developing through the RICS. So the universal offer, while yes, in, entirely not funded currently, actually has the funding for the staffing for the attainment advisors, some of the work that's gone on for the conferences and events that have happened locally, as well as um, the collaboration work that's now been, been underpinned regionally. Um, so there's a kind of three three tiers of the system, those two, and, and then the universal yeah. offer. Okay, thank and you. We have that, sorry, but we have that national role to be able to gather, as I've said already, some of that practice and be able to share that widely so that everybody across Scotland has access to um, examples and materials and support to be able to take forward that work. Okay, thank you, Oliver, and then Ross. Thank you, uh, Convener. I just want to return to that point where you're saying 95% of schools uh, get PEF funding. In my uh, constituency, um, which is much more rural, it's, it's not 95%, and there's a number of small schools who have very little discretion. Um, given that rurality and, and poverty uh, often go hand in hand, and it, it, it does limit uh, people's opportunities, how, how are those schools meant to deliver some of this best practice? Rural deprivation, uh, you know, is, is for a country like Scotland a, sig a significant element, and there's lots of work um, that's gone on both nationally and locally, um, looking at um, what are the indicators of rural poverty, what are the unique factors around it, and actually how do we, as an education community, come together to support practitioners in those situations and to make sure that that they get the same level of support, the same. So if examples. they get no PEF funding, they have far less. Head teachers in those schools have far less discretion uh, mm -hmm. to deliver uh, the sort of local solutions that you're talking about. Yeah. So some of the work that um, the Association of Directors of Education Scotland and Education Scotland and others have done is to look at um, what are those indicators? How could we how could we classify um, the indicators of rural poverty? And then how could we use those to look at the application of PEF funding? and advise around actually a, a, a greater share across rural communities. So, would you so we are doing that, that work that, and that then the Scottish the model's government... model's not right at the moment? The I'd say that, that it's based on free school meals, which is the only uh, indicator available as a national statistics that was able, able to be used. But there is ongoing work and there has been um, a actual committee discussion, and, and not this committee, a, a committee discussion and a look at um, what we can do around that to reflect the whole of Scotland within PEF community. There has been significant work. So this year, the PEF funding, more money has gone um, to more schools across Scotland, but there could be further work done to look at that and to reflect rural poverty and that rural deprivation, because significant parts of Scotland are, are within that, that community. And moving on, would you say that overall you've got enough data um, around uh, PEF funding and attainment challenge to, to really understand what works? We've heard today lots of uh, good examples of, of, of good practice, but is there research and detailed analysis to back that up, or do you just sort of take anecdotal examples of good practice and put them into case studies, or do we drill into it and see what, what actually delivers the most change? It's, it's of course, an evaluative process. Um, it wouldn't be based on anecdotes, and, you know, Education Scotland's approach is evidence-based, evidence and research-based to drive improvement. That's the nature of, of educational improvement cycle, um, and we are looking at that. In terms of the, uh, you know, it is pretty early days, and particularly around the PEF funding in particular, if you're talking about that, because um, if we look at the interventions that people are putting in place, it's about, you know, when we'll see the, the impact of that intervention in children and young people in the communities. We're getting emerging evidence of that, and we're gathering more of it, and there's an evaluation strategy as part of that, but it, it's in particular at the moment, um, you know, not consistent and certainly something that we're looking at gathering the evidence of, we're certainly focused on. It's picked up through our inspections and we'll continue to do that. Head teachers are 
um, reporting a confidence in their expectations and their expectations of impact on outcomes. We will wait to see that actually delivered in, in, in terms of impact. But Louise might want to say more. Um, I don't think I have anything further to add. Um, you'd mentioned their inspections. Do you think that given uh, the sort of scale of reforms, a number of different things that are going on, do you think you're doing enough inspections to get a clear and accurate picture of what's going on in different schools across different parts of the country? We are um, use a sampling methodology, as I know uh, the committee is aware, and we are um, moving to increase uh, our number of, of inspections uh, to 250 next year. But we have actually done, that's our main uh, focus activities. It's part of a range of scrutiny activities. One of the strengths of Scottish education is that scrutiny is, is sector-led. It's about evaluation, self-evaluation. It's about head teachers and local authorities and others taking part collaboratively in that process. We are, um, as Liz mentioned, recruiting further um, in inspectors to add to that, but that's to add to our suite of, to allow us to do uh, thematic reviews, where we'll sample, um, say we looked at mathematics across Scotland, we'll do a sample across different layers in the system, schools, teachers, head teachers, parents, we'll look at what's happening there, we'll bring that back, we'll use evaluative methodology to then reflect that back into the system and imp drive improvement further forward. We already do significant numbers of, of inspections every year and we are increasing that um, as, as we move forward. Liz. I think also that because we have attainment advisors in each of the authorities, then they, they produce and contribute to a quarterly report um, of the activities that are happening within that authority. But increasingly, that that's more and more evaluative, um, and we're seeing signs of, of impact within that. So we get a very comprehensive view um, quarterly of actually what's happening in each local authority through our work with the team advisors, who are actually the people that are very often working with practitioners on the ground in classrooms. So we, we get it from them. Throughout uh, our inquiry, we've heard about a huge sort of variation and disparity between different local authorities, between different schools within local authorities and some of the schools you would expect based on uh, their demographic to perform in the same way and they don't. Uh, what, what are you doing to, to pick up on that and how, does, how do these evaluations that you talk about identify where, where, where things are not working well? It depends how we, how we identify that. So, for example, if we were to identify that through an inspection activity, um, then we would um, work to support the school. And actually, um, that might be brokering support with another school. It might be actually um, revisiting that school. It might be putting in um, some of our staff to support. It might be asking attainment advisors to support. So there's a whole range of, of information. Um, we, we know that schools can be different. We know that within schools, they can be different. Um, we also um, have to remember that improvement is statutory responsibility of the local authority who um, have to secure improvement in all of their schools and we might work with the local authority to enable them to do that. So that there is a, a sort of patchy provision you know, or a sort of postcode lottery in effect of you know, how, 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 how schools are performing? That would be how we would relate to it or, or recognise it. It would be about looking at the improvement journey of a school and the community that they work with. Some um, are facing significant challenges um, in terms of, of the community and some of the deprivation and the poverty issues. These Others um, are, are facing different challenges around um, the, the quality of education that they provide. So it's about the cycle of improvement schools go through uh, and, and across cycles of improvement. And we would want to be there working in partnership with their colleagues, working in partnership with the people in that institution to make sure that they are supported on whatever their next step of an improvement journey would be. But schools, by their nature, reflect the communities they serve. They all aspire um, to be the very best that they can be. And our job is to support them and their colleagues to ensure that we have that highest outcome as possible for excellence and equity for all children. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Ross and then Liz, did you want to comment? No, right, OK. Mira, um, Education in Scotland sets out a number of entitlements for all young people under curriculum for excellence that include stuff like personal support to enable them to uh, gain as much as possible from the opportunities that uh, CFE can provide. Uh, forgive me if I misunderstood your answer to John Lament's earlier question, but if in the course of an inspection you are unable to conclude that 
the entitlement to personal support is not being met due to understaffing or under-resourcing. How are you effectively inspecting against those entitlements? That's not um, what I was representing. Um, uh, what I was representing was that the focus is on attainment and achievement and the leadership of that on inspection, the quality of teaching and learning, and the focus on our quality improvement indicators. Of course, if we felt that learners' needs were not being met, we would comment on it. We have a duty to comment on it. It's one of our core quality improvement indicators. So we would very clearly be indicating that and do uh, comment on that in, in inspections. So, so you're able to clearly indicate that the needs are not being met because of understaffing, if that is indeed the case? If that was to be the case, it would be about what's the school doing to rectify that, if anything, what are the mediation that's gone in place, and what's the impact of that on learners? Because that's our focus, the impact on the outcomes for children and young people. So, sorry, just to be completely clear, there are then school inspection reports in existence at the moment that make reference to understaffing or under-resourcing as an issue? What we talk about is the impact on learners. That could be for a number of factors. But if so, you can't identify what the factor is, how can we make the improvements? We will in uh, in, in talk about areas for development and areas for improvement. So there are school inspection reports out there that I, identify understaffing and under resourcing. I would need to go back and, and talk to colleagues about that. What there will be is comments about improvement in terms of the learner journey, in terms of consistency in learning, in terms of the quality of the curriculum. Um, whatever the particular impact of that happens to be. So under the core quality indicators, which are very clear in terms of the criterion, because it's a shared and open, transparent framework, we would be very clear about identifying what are the issues, the risks and the successes of the work in that area. Um, Liz, I don't know whether you want to say more. Um, I think, as Gail said, we would need to go back and, and talk to colleagues, but... Um, what we also have is we have a summary of evidence uh, inspection findings. So um, while it may not make it to the actual letter of the report, then there's a whole summary of inspection findings which sits behind the report. But that's open as well because we publish that summary of inspection findings for, for anyone to look at. And it's possible that it's not in the report, but there's a comment in the summary of inspection findings. It, it feels like you're doing this with one hand tied behind your back, but to, to move to separate element of it. Uh, we, during the course of a previous inquiry, took a substantial amount of evidence on the link between poverty and additional support needs. The inspection regime has come under some criticism in the past for a lack of focus on additional support needs provision within mainstream schools. What work have you done to address that to ensure that inspections are taking account of that and identifying whether or not additional support needs are being met effectively? On every single inspection, that's an area that um, we've looked at. Um, it's a really um, key area. It, it's my personal background is in, within additional support needs. Um, so it's an area that I'm particularly passionate about. Um, on every single inspection, we look at one of the quality indicators, which is about ensuring well-being, equality and inclusion. And we would give um, a school an evaluation of, of how well they're doing in that area. Um, so that's right across. And that would pick up additional support needs. We, we look at additional support needs in terms of individual children. So we might take an individual child in a secondary school and, and follow that child um, throughout the school day to actually see how their needs are met within different curricular areas. Um, we would also work with the support staff, the guidance staff, to actually see what um, um, uh, things, adjustments are being put into place in classrooms to actually enable that child to um, access the whole curriculum. Um, we would look at what support um, the school's doing. Um, we would look at, for example, in a secondary school, um, are they meeting alternative assessment arrangements for the SQA examinations so that all these, these are put into place. So every single inspection would look at additional support needs. I understand that that, in theory, should be the case, but do you recognise the criticism, such as that from perhaps Kindred, uh, as an example of an organisation who's made it, that that is not consistently happening? That inspections are not consistently picking up the quality of additional support need provision? That's not something I would recognise that when um, my colleagues are out on inspection and every inspection we would look at additional support needs of the, the children in that school. Right, thank you. Very briefly, yeah. please. Very interested in this question. I just want to follow up from the questions from a colleague, Ross Greer, on this issue about what you are able to say in the context for the lack of support for young people. So if you go in and you identify that a young person has not been supported adequately, indeed Enable and others have said that some young people have got half days 
uh, theoretically they're full time, but they've got half a day a week or a day a week. And if the head teacher says to you, I understand we should be giving this child more support, but I am unable to because I have not got the staffing or resources to do it. Well, I understand that you want to say you need to give that young person support, but does the inspection report reflect when the head teacher tells you, I would love to do that, but I cannot do it because I haven't got the appropriate resource? I think there's a couple of things. I think that's a really um, interesting observation. Um, we have occasions, you mentioned um, part-time timetables. So if we were to find um, a school where children are on part-time timetables, then we would have a discussion with the school. We might very well have a discussion with the local authority who are, who are responsible for that child. Um, we might also be able to point the school to um, alternative arrangements. So for example, we've mentioned um, work with third sector. And we've seen some very good work across Scotland where young people with additional support needs are, are being supported but to achieve and attain. Do, do you and sorry, do you understand this is not about specific individuals? But if you're seeing a pattern within a school or schools where these needs are not being met, yes, there are individual things you might suggest to school to do for those individual young people. I suspect the staff already thought of these things. But if the school tells you, or the schools tell you, or there's a pattern of schools indicating to you that they're unable to do what they would like to do to improve the learner journey for the individual child because they don't have the resources, would that be reflected in an inspection report? Or would it be something that you would feed back to the Scottish Government and the Cabinet Secretary and your private advice to him? It would probably be a combination of all of those, um, because it would also, as Liz indicated, it would be reported and discussed with the QIO who attends the feedback meetings at the end of the inspection process, so the Quality Improvement Officer and the local authority norm would normally attend those feedback sessions where any issues like that would be raised. And certainly, we have an um, area lead officer for local authorities as well. If there was a pattern, as you were saying, that was you know, beginning to emerge through inspections, that would be immediately be highlighted to the area lead officer to bring to the attention of the local authority and for there to be dialogue and discussion about it. So it would be on a range of layers, a range of layers, you know, it may be reported mm -hmm. through the school inspection report. And if the local report. authority says it's because we haven't got enough money, mm -hmm. what, do, what then happens? Then we would be gathering evidence and certainly that would be the sort of information that we would be feeding back, A, on the Chief Inspector's annual inspection report, that these trends are emer emerging, and we'd also be feeding that back in, in to Scottish Government colleagues around policy and discussions about improving the system moving forward. Okay, thank you. Just before uh, I bring in George for the, the last point, two things from that whole session there. One is that uh, earlier on, Gail Cotland was talking about the best practice in Western Bartshire. What would be the role of the attainment advisor if some of those schools weren't doing using the PEF money in the way that you had described to Gillian Martin? Would you feed that back or um, where is your role in that? Within Western Bartonshire, there's a very clear uh, focus on improving and okay but uh, uh, not necessarily you individually but an attainment advisor and their local authority sees practice it's not of best practice what happens then it doesn't have to be your answers i'm not yeah yeah <laughs> So, as we've outlined already, it would be for the, that local decision making. So, the role of the attainment advisor, first and foremost, would be to understand the school's self evaluation and the rationale that they developed for particular interventions, um, to look at, as we've talked about already, the outcomes and the measures that are already in place, and to provide that support and challenge to be able to. Um, prompt head teachers and teachers to think really critically about the difference that an intervention is making and we would be able to support those schools that if we there was evidence that that intervention was not making a difference or indeed was making um, a negative impact then the role of the team advisor would be to support that uh, through challenging conversations and also we would very clearly in our guidance say if you've started something and you're monitoring the progress of that and it very clearly shows that that action or that, that set of actions is not making a difference then absolutely stop that action and let's refocus and we would provide our support in that area um, and as uh, Liz has mentioned already we pull together information um, in our quarterly updates of, of, uh, through what's happening across all the local authorities so as an organisation we would be able to pick that up through that process, but also we have regular discussion with attainment advisors. So if there was a pattern emerging, as we've mentioned earlier, then we would be able to be alerted to that and be able to use our area lead officer and other networks to be able to support that. 
Okay, thank you. And just a very last point uh, is uh, about the inspections and the underfunding the, or the lack of staffing and stuff. I take it that your first protocol would be to local authorities who are responsible for staffing and, and uh, the schools. Yeah. Right, thank you. George? You know, just uh, one of the, and just the last point is, one of the things we've heard is parental involvement is obviously one of the most important things in uh, raising attainment because, but the problem we, or the challenge we have is the fact that there's a lot of parents out there that have a negative experience with school themselves as well. Now, I'm looking at some of the stuff that Education Scotland provides. You've got a parental engagement toolkit and also a parent zone. Now, my, my kids are now adults. You know, so if I was, my kids were of school age, I'm not going near that adult zone. So how would you engage with parents and how, how can you make that relevant to the parents so that you can actually ensure that they're involved? Um, I, I absolutely recognise your point and that's why the local activity is really central. Um, so from my experience, the, the best place to have parental engagement is actually between the teacher or the head teacher and their local community and the parents that they work with because they formed a relationship. Um, there's obviously a, the shared child in, across uh, from the educators and, and parents. And so they're able to have those local discussions. So a lot of our materials is around guidance and support and drawing on best practice for local head teachers and teachers and others to work with locally. So it would be, be about, you know, opening up the school to, to various events, going out to community events, you know, running. There's been lots of activities that have been going on. Um, there's a um, uh, maths and munch activities that have been going on. There's been a, you know, pizza and literacy activities that have gone on that are about engaging different parents in different ways who may not be your parents who'd come to the front door of the school for the very reasons that you've stated. So there's, there's guidance and there's creativity happening out there about actually locally at school level Head teachers need our is to provide the guidance to celebrate the best practice and to make those connections. But actually, the delivery at local level is very much an interaction between the school and the parents that they serve, and and that's actually fundamentally where that relationship is is really central in terms of supporting family engagement and some of the family learning work we've provided. Some of the guidance around that will facilitate that. Um, will and the attainment officers possibly provide some of the support for? Head teachers and that, and that they do in some cases, but was. I think that one of the, the one of the really successes, one of the, the big successes of um, recent years, has been the the focus on family learning. Um, I think we were in a position where, with how good is our school for, we introduced a new quality indicator, which was on family learning. And I think that really then focused schools' attention towards family learning. I think one of the drivers within the National Improvement Framework is around, as, as you've um, been talking about, parental engagement. One of the key um, levers within the Scottish Attainment Challenge has been about families and communities. So we have got a real drive from, from different perspectives, different lenses towards really um, focusing on how parents can support their children more effectively. And also in terms of family learning, how we get intergenerational learning and how um, people learn together. And we know from um, our reports um, that actually that's an area that is really developing very well. Um, and I think Gail's mentioned a couple of these. I think Gail's got another example. Um, what we notice in Western Bartonshire is that the um, interest in family, developing family learning alongside school improvement is very prevalent in head teachers' discussions. Um, one of the successful interventions in Western Bartonshire has been a step up four year project whereby the team have worked very hard to overcome the barriers for parents. They've made sure that there was transport available to the venues, they made sure that there was food and that there was creche facilities. It was an effective partnership between maths teachers, primary teachers highly trained in the best methodology for mathematics, working alongside a dance specialist. So it was a creative approach to teaching mathematics. And the, the aim for family learning was about giving confidence to parents in supporting their children in literacy, um, in numeracy rather. Um, as a result of that, the children, the data showed us that there was an increase in confidence from 10% to 87% within a year. 
So across Western Bartonshire, we're seeing head teachers sharing the same terminology now. The first one was called a beyond the bell activity. We're now hearing that across schools. What are we going to do beyond the bell and how are we going to involve families and, and the community? Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for that. Uh, can I thank you all for attending today? That brings us to the end of the first panel of witnesses. Uh, and I'll suspend for a couple of minutes between panels to allow the witnesses to change over. Thank you very much. I hope we can. What camera was that? Can I welcome to this meeting John Swinney, Cabinet Secretary for Education and Skills, Fiona Robertson, Director of Learning, and Graham Logan, Deputy Director of Strategy and Performance of the Scottish Government. Thank you for coming along today. I understand, Cabinet Secretary, you'd like to make a short opening statement. Uh, thank you, Convener. I welcome this opportunity to discuss the committee's inquiry into the attainment and achievement of school aged children experiencing poverty. Can I start by reaffirming the Government's commitment to improving Scottish education and closing the poverty-related attainment gap? This work is, of course, part of the wider Getting It Right for Every Child agenda. We want every child or young person and family to be offered the right help at the right time from the right people. This is a broadly based approach within Government, drawing together the contribution of various policy areas, including health, justice and housing, for example, and the focused approach of the Scottish Attainment Challenge represents the education aspect of this agenda, 
which is set within our National Improvement Framework vision to deliver excellence through raising attainment and the achievement of equity for all uh, within Scottish education. We have committed to putting £750 million into the Attainment Scotland Fund over the course of this Parliament and to support schools and local authorities in tackling the attainment gap. We are providing £120 million of pupil equity funding on an annual basis. This money goes straight to schools for head teachers to spend on supporting children and young people affected by poverty to achieve their full potential. The approach we are taking with this funding is designed to empower schools with the means by which we can address the challenges of the poverty-related attainment gap. Naturally, the approach is taken will vary according to individual circumstances of schools around the country, uh, for, which is for them to make a judgment on what is appropriate for the needs of their pupils. Over recent weeks, we've seen a range of different approaches to utilising pupil equity funding shared widely across social media channels as we encourage consideration of the most effective interventions for improvement in performance. We're already seeing the impact of the Scottish Attainment Challenge and the Pupil Equity Fund. It is making a real difference in classrooms across the country and impacting on the lives of children and young people. The recent Attainment Scotland funding evaluation showed the positive impact it is having on schools in Scotland's most deprived communities. The National Improvement Framework is now giving us more data than ever before, enabling a deeper understanding of educational strengths and weaknesses at all levels of the system. Our consultation on a framework for assessing our progress in closing the poverty-related attainment gap has established a broad consensus that a single measure cannot describe the attainment gap properly, it has also confirmed general support for a package of indicators and improvement goals that builds on the range of measures we already have in place. There is great strength convener in Scottish education, but we must do more for those children affected by poverty. That is why we're investing the funds we are investing in the, Scot the Attainment Scotland Fund, and I look forward to considering the conclusions of the committee on this subject uh, for the information and value they will have for forthcoming government policy. I mean, so can I just remind everybody that we've got a lot to get through today, so if we can have questions and answers as succinct as we possibly can, and I'll start off with Richard Lockhart. Uh, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. <clears throat> in terms of one of the motivations for the committee to have this inquiry was a recognition that it's not just what happens within the classroom that impacts on closing the attainment gap, it's what happens outside the classroom as well. And I'm interested in terms of uh, how the Scottish Government has increase its understanding of the impact of rising poverty in Scotland, the causes of that poverty and the impact that has on your policy intention of closing the attainment gap? The first thing I'd say is that the poverty-related attainment gap has been a, a very persistent feature of Scottish education for many years. And what the government has decided to do as a principal focus of our policy programme in this parliamentary term is to do as much as we possibly can do as part of what we recognise to be a longer term journey, perhaps uh, of the order of 10 years, to close the poverty-related attainment gap. So that level of priority is significant in, uh, in policy terms because what it signals to, uh, I think, a, a wider grouping of ministers beyond just my responsibilities in the field of education and skills is the point that Mr Lockhead makes about the importance of other areas of government being actively involved in supporting the work that we are involved in. So, for example, the um, measures that have been taken forward in the delivery plan under the Child Poverty Scotland uh, Act that was recently passed by Parliament is a really important step in trying to identify what are the, the wider interventions that we might, we might make, for example. Um, another example of that is the work that we are taking forward on adverse childhood events, where um, a few weeks ago um, I hosted, uh, along with a range of other ministers, a discussion at Bell Houston Academy of a whole range of stakeholders who are involved in the, uh, addressing the issues of adverse childhood events because we recognise without doing so, we will not address the obstacles to learning that will affect young people who go through such an experience. And the same rationale extends to young people in, uh, who experience poverty. So I think within government, there is a broad understanding of the significance of um, policy concerns of that type around poverty or around adverse childhood um, events um, or other sig significant impediments to the ability of young people to be able to learn um, as part of their education. I suppose finally, convener, um, 
Mr Lockhead raises the issue of um, the pattern of poverty and obviously um, there are wider implications and uh, wider factors uh, which, over which the government uh, does not have control, where uh, the policy framework of the United Kingdom, for example, the emphasis on welfare reform, the reductions in, um, in benefit entitlement in some circumstances, um, will undeniably contribute towards making our challenge ever greater. Um, but I think what we have in place now is a policy framework which is very clearly focused on addressing the substantial issue that Mr Lockhead raises with me. A lot of the evidence, I think you've indicated that, uh, we've received ha has shown that, if anything, the trend is, is going the wrong direction in terms of poverty in, in Scotland. And many of the witnesses have uh, pinpointed the UK government's welfare reforms um, as the key reason behind that uh, unfortunate trend. Therefore, what, what, what are you able to do as Cabinet Secretary for Education to explain to the UK government, for instance, that their policies are impacting on the attainment gap in Scotland schools? Because the debate at the moment seems to be that education has devolved and welfare reform is reserved, albeit we're now getting more powers in Scotland. And, and therefore, people are not identifying the link between these two responses to ta uh, closing the attainment gap. There's two points I'd make in response to that. The first is that Clearly, the Scottish Government makes very active representations, both publicly and privately, to the United Kingdom Government about the issue of welfare reform. And um, we certainly set out uh, on a persistent basis our concerns about the welfare reform agenda and the implications that will have for children and families within Scotland. And uh, that is communicated in a range of different ways. It will, without doubt, be communicated uh, by the Finance Secretary in the communications that he makes to the Chancellor about forthcoming spending decisions. Um, and uh, that will be a, 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 a constant feature of our uh, discussions and dialogue with the UK Government. So I think the, the Scottish Government makes every endeavour to say to the UK Government we would in, encourage them to take a different course of action. And I think that's been demonstrated by the contributions we have made to this debate over time. The second thing, the second point I'd say in response to Mr Lockhead is the, uh, is the opportunities that we have within the Scottish Government to use our own policy instruments to try to address that. Now that's not, um, that's not cost free because obviously we're now spending um, before the acquisition of our new powers in the field of social security uh, about £130 million trying to ameliorate some of the effect and I stress it's some of the effect of the welfare reform changes that are made by the United Kingdom government. But we have an opportunity through the work that we're undertaking on the implementation of the social security legislation to put in place measures that will more adequately reflect the policy approach within Scotland and complement our devolved responsibilities where we are able to do so within our um, uh, our powers in relation to social security. So that combination of trying to encourage the UK government to take a different course and then to use the responsibilities that we have to try to affect the situation is the approach the Scottish government would take. Okay, and my final question, if that's okay, is um, you, you clearly have a great deal of sympathy for myself because you're going to have lots more calls on the budget to deal with the fallout of poverty caused by UK government welfare reform policies and the Scottish budget and the education budget can only go so far. Uh, however, we have heard many good ideas from witnesses about what influence Scottish Government policies can have in tackling poverty and closing the attainment gap. And I just want to raise with you the whole issue of um, holiday provision of food and breakfast clubs in, in schools. And there's many fantastic initiatives across the country to help our, our children you know, be fit for learning because they can have a decent meal, particularly when the schools are not actually meeting uh, in term time, but over the holiday period as well. Uh, so I hope, uh, I don't know if you, you've had a chance to see the evidence witnesses, but is that something that you would be willing to explore further about how we can spread that best practice across Scotland? Well, I, I'm, I'm very pleased to um, encourage consideration of these uh, options. Um, I visited St Francis Primary School in Dundee some weeks ago, and one of the examples, of, which was an example of how pupil equity funding was being used where St Francis Primary School had uh, put in place um, essentially holiday provision for um, a combination of play, 
um, food and learning for young people over the summer break. And when the school was able, because of the, the collection of data within the school on the performance of young people, the school were able to show to me the, um, the attainment of young people in the period August to December before they had introduced the, uh, the, the summer holiday um, play, learning and food uh, um, uh, proposition with the August to December after they had done so. And the impact on the learning of young people was, uh, was, was remarkable. And it was because there was some, uh, and they attributed that to the constancy of nutrition and play and the development that comes out of play for young people and the opportunity to enhance learning and teaching. So there's just one example of a, an individual primary school undertaking that. And of course, in our, we've just completed a series of pupil equity fund events around the country um, in all parts of Scotland. And we've been using those, those occasions to highlight examples of best practice. And that's one very good example. Um, we've seen a proposal coming in for the Scottish Attainment Challenge for the Challenge Authority Programme for 2018-19 from North Lanarkshire Council, which is um, a very interesting and, and a proposal that we have supported and that we're jointly agreed with North Lanarkshire Council, which will see young people having access to um, nutrition during the school holidays um, to support their wider learning. And it's a, uh, it's a very good initiative from North Lanarkshire Council. Um, and we're very pleased that the Scottish Attainment Challenge has been used in an imaginative way to extend the impact and the, the, uh, uh, and the capacity of education to transform the lives of young people in poverty. Thank you much, Oliver. Thank you. Uh, convener, I was uh, going to return to a point. I understand the Cabinet Secretary was watching some of the um, education Scotland evidence around, uh, my point was around pupil equity funding uh, and particularly whether or not the the current model serves rural communities well. Um, obviously, within my own constituency, there are a large number of uh, primary schools, particularly small primary schools, that don't get any uh, PEF funding and therefore maybe lack the flexibility and discretion to introduce measures that they know would work in their schools. Well, I think the, 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 the key point here, um, and I, I think I've rehearsed some of these arguments with the committee previously um, is the decisions we've taken around what is the allocation mechanism for pupil equity funding. Uh, I, there essentially are two choices available to us. One would be to use the Scottish Index of Multiple Deprivation. The other is to use pu uh, eligibility for free school meals. I opted not to use the Scottish Index of Multiple Deprivation because as a measure, it is very good at identifying substantive group, groups, groupings of poverty and areas of poverty. It is not very good at identifying individual instances of the presentation of poverty. So the free school meals uh, eligibility criteria give us a more comprehensive um, presentation of the, of the prevalence of poverty. And that results in about 95, 96% of schools receiving some funding from pupil equity funding. Now, what I've said to the committee before is that that's the, that's the most comprehensive mechanism I have available to me. I'm very happy to engage in dialogue about how we could find a more comprehensive mechanism because I accept fundamentally the point that Mr. Mundell makes, which is that in rural communities, the prevalence of poverty may be more difficult to identify. And in smaller schools, there may be a reluctance of families to come forward and say that they are eligible for free school meals because it, it's perhaps slightly more obvious in a, in a school of 20 pupils than it is in a school of 200 or 300 pupils. So I'm quite, uh, and, and I've, openly said I'm, I'm happy to engage in that discussion. I've not seen mechanisms so far that, that would provide us with a more comprehensive approach than the one that we are taking, but I remain open to consideration of that point uh, if there is such um, evidence emerging. Fourth. 
To me, a, a very obvious solution to that would be to have some mechanism that allowed head teachers in those particular schools to, to bid in uh, or sort of identify within their own pupil base uh, where, where they believe there are issues of underlying poverty. I think that, that expertise already exists uh, within some of those schools. And I think the, the broader problem for me is I, there are schools you know, a matter of miles down the road who are getting very large amounts of, of, of PEF funding. Um, we're now in a position where some parents are taking decisions around which school they would like to send their children to uh, be, based on, on the opportunities that are available uh, because of PEF fin funding in other schools that are not available uh, to all pupils. Does that not then just create a different type of inequality within those rural communities? I, I, I don't... I'm not familiar with the data of that type, um, but I do think that the fact that pupil equity funding is reaching 95% of schools in Scotland does indicate uh, very s substantial coverage of the country in relation to the extent and the, in, in rural the, communities, the, it's, there's a big the, difference to in the, the percentages and there. The, it covers the, uh, the extent and the prevalence of poverty in a very wide number of locations in the country. Now, as I said, I'm, I'm very happy to consider uh, ways in which we can demonstrate um, the broadest possible coverage that we can. But I think what we, the suggestion that um, Mr. Mundell makes is, is one that would have to come, there would have to be a range of eligibility criteria to determine which schools could apply for certain amounts of funding because one of the policy points that we've accepted in principle is that if we want to tackle, if we want to close the poverty-related uh, attainment gap, we have to target increased resources to make a difference where that poverty presents itself. So if we accept that policy point in principle, we have to have a policy rationale for some other um, mechanism to, uh, to, to, to determine eligibility. I suppose the final point I would make, convener, is that you know, I think one of the lessons I take from um, uh, pupil equity funding is that it has been very beneficial in empowering schools to take decisions that make a difference about the experience of individual young people within those schools. Um, so what we will certainly um, give consideration to is what is the degree of flexibility over wider budgetary arrangements that might be suitable for head teachers to exercise some of the flexibility that Mr Mundell talks about. Um, and just on the, finally, on, on that flexibility point, throughout this inquiry we've heard you know, very mixed messages from different organisations, from third sectors, uh, from some people involved in the education profession around how much flexibility does actually exist. In some local authorities, there's quite a lot of direction uh, given to head teachers, quite a lot of scrutiny uh, over the individual decisions they make. Uh, we've heard uh, from Education Scotland now that uh, they provide guidance, but they, they don't really have a role and it, it's meant to be very localised, but that doesn't always uh, seem as if their decision-making powers lie solely with the, the head teacher. This is a significant issue, and the guidance that has been issued in this respect is guidance that's been jointly agreed between the Government, the Convention of Scottish Local Authorities, and the Association of Directors of Education in Scotland and Education Scotland. So there is one central piece of guidance that should um, provide the necessary framework for decision-making by individual head teachers. So I think that's uh, that's pretty clear. Um, what I would, and the whole purpose of pupil equity funding, and it's a condition of grant, so if I see practice that um, is not working within the spirit that I'm about to talk about, it's a condition of grant, so the money, the money can be uh, held back, and on one occasion I have held money back, from a local authority because I was not satisfied about exactly the issues that Mr Mundell raises. Um, the, the, the spirit of PEF is that head teachers must decide 
in consultation with their staff and their parents and their pupils, what's going to make the biggest impact in their schools. And certainly as I go around the country, um, I see very, very good examples of that happening. If there are examples where that's not happening, where people feel they haven't got the flexibility, then I, then I would be very happy to hear about them because that's not in the spirit of it and it's most definitely not in line with the grant conditions which matter to be applied in relation to how this is deployed. So the condition of grant when we distribute the money to a local authority is it's going off to the school and the head teacher and school community have got to decide how this is being used. If that's not people's experience, that's a breach of the condition of grant and I would want to know about it. Thank you. Liz, did you want to come in very briefly on that point? Just on this point, uh, convener, um, Mr Swinney, you, you've been very clear indeed that the uh, PEF funding goes direct to schools and that the responsibility for making the decision uh, rests with them. And we've also been very clear as a committee that there are very good examples of how PEF funding is improving um, the situation that we're all trying to address. Can I just be very clear about the lines of accountability for how that money is spent and how you measure the effectiveness of it? Because at this morning's panel, we had a little bit of doubt as to whether the responsibility lay with the head teacher to be accountable to parents and young people and the communities, or whether it lay with their regional collaborative being involved, their local authority being involved. And in answer to a question to Gillian Martin, um, I thought it was a bit of a doubt as to exactly who was responsible if there was any problem with it. And you've just said yourself, that you would want, you personally would want to know uh, if there was a, a situation where that money was not being used appropriately. Now, that, that seems to me that we, we've got to be careful about this um, desire to allow head teachers to have far more control, but at the same time, there's the implication that the central government or local authorities might actually be prepared to step in and say, no, don't spend the money that way. I, I think, with the greatest respect, I think Liz Smith misinterprets my answer to. Oliver Mundell, because my answer to Mr Mundell was essentially making the point that PEF is designed to be spent according to the decision making um, of head teachers through their engagement with teachers, pupils and, and uh, parents within their school community. So the decision making power as to how to spend the money rests with the head teacher. The hard public finance accountability for the spending of the money rests with the local authority because they, the, they are the recipient of the grant. Why is that the case? Well, I judged that that was administratively more efficient to send the money to local authorities with the amounts for each individual school for the local authority to do the public finance accountability rather than to create 2,500 administrative systems in 2,500 schools for the handling of what can be, in certain circumstances, quite substantial sums of public money. So, the, in public accountability terms, public finance accountability terms, the local authority is the one who will be held accountable for that by Audit Scotland. And we've had discussions with Audit Scotland and with local authorities about those arrangements, and those arrangements are are satisfactory. The, so I think the, 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 the lines of accountability are, are, are very clear that the decision-making power rests with the head teacher in the school community. Um, they may choose to collaborate in certain ways with other schools, with the local authority, with the regional collaborative on certain things, and that's entirely at their discretion. And then when it comes to the assessment of the public finance accountability requirements, that rests with the local authority. Just, can I just pursue the logic of that? Because again, in answer to Gillian Martin, uh, are you saying that the local authority holds the overall say on how well that PEF money is being uh, spent? No. Well, can I just clarify who you believe has that final responsibility and therefore the line of accountability for the actual spend? Well, well that, I, 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 that's why I've answered the question I've answered in the way I've answered it. Decision-making power, control, responsibility for how effectively it is spent 
rests with head teachers. That is what that's that's the shift of thinking that goes with PEF. So we're saying to head teachers, here is some money to use in a very focused way to tackle the to, to close the poverty related attainment gap. And um and you've got to make the best professional judgment you can about how those resources should be spent. But in public finance accountability terms, I suppose, the, this, uh, in, which is a judgment about has the money been spent on the purpose for which it was intended, it's maybe the best way to express it, that rests with the local authority. But there's a number of questions around about PEF, uh, Cabinet Secretary. Um, so if we could just make them as concise as possible, we do have a lot. It's George first. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Much of the debate during this inquiry has been uh, how PEF money is spent, and it's probably summed up in a quote from Martin Canavan from Aberlour, who said to us that there is a real inconsistency in the understanding of PEF and how it is being interpreted and applied in different schools. It works well where teachers are engaged and supported to use the money in the best way they can. Now, on the whole, Cabinet Secretary, how do you, as the Scottish Government or uh, Education Scotland local authority, how do you work together to ensure that that's what happened, that support's there for everyone? That's essentially um, drawn together through the work that um, uh, I take forward through the the Scottish Education Council that I've established, which brings together all of the, the, the players I need to have around the table to create a consistent direction in Scottish education. So that brings together our local authority partners, the leads of our regional improvement collaboratives, the uh, local authority chief executives, the uh, directors of education, the schools of education, crucially, um, parents and pupils, and also the professional associations. So I, try to use that body to create the consistency of direction. And actually, I think, you know, I'm one of the areas where I feel we've got a real strength just now is we've got a very clear, consistent policy direction on how we take forward um, the, the, these aspects of education. And then all of that dialogue is designed to inform the support that's put in place um, at, at local level to support individual schools. Um, and that will essentially be undertaken through the collaboration that's supported by the regional improvement collaboratives and also by the work that's undertaken by local authorities uh, with the active participation of Education Scotland with their role to improve the performance of Scottish education. So I think the, the support package is there and I want to make sure it's, it's very visibly there for um, schools because it's through the enhancement of learning and teaching, through the enhancement of leadership within schools, through the enhancement of um, family and community involvement, that we will have the biggest effect in closing the poverty-related attainment gap. Cabinet Secretary, uh, obviously there's different people. We're all different. And some of the examples we've had in evidence here is Nancy Clooney from Dilmarnock Primary came along. Dynamic, total dynamo. We all loved her you know, when she came here, but not everybody is Nancy Clooney. So how she literally took a community by the scruff of the neck and said, I'm going to create a community here within my school as the centre of it. Now, that's fantastic and it works here in Dilmarnock. How, how do you see uh, that we can probably take that best practice and share it throughout the country to make sure, because she, pay funding was part one of the things that she says, I want some of that, this is what I'm going to do with it. You know, how do we get that kind of, not everybody's going to have that dynamic personality, but how do we get that same kind of thing throughout the country? The, the first thing is that we, we need to ensure that we celebrate and promote evidence to best, back, evidence to best practice. So if we have examples that are clearly having an effect on closing the attainment gap, then I want to make sure they are widely understood within Scottish education and the regional collaboratives are there to, to help us to do all of that. So there's a much wider sharing of achievement and best practice throughout the system. And I'm very pleased with the way in which local authorities have embraced the concept of regional collaboration and are now working very actively to ensure that that makes a greater impact on individual classrooms. The second area, and this 
relates to, I suppose, the question that's put to me about Nancy Clooney. It's about the enhancement of leadership within education. And there are a number of ways in which we support that investment in leadership. Uh, the Scottish College of Educational Leadership has now got a much stronger presence within our system uh, as part of Education Scotland. So the real strengths of educational leadership can be supported and enhanced around the country. Um, the second uh, aspect is the work that we are undertaking through uh, Columba 1400, which is um, a, a third sector venture in which the government and the Hunter Foundation uh, fund um, a leadership development programme through Columba 1400, in which cohorts of about um, 20 to 30 head teachers or aspiring head teachers um, work with Columba 1400 to develop stronger leadership skills. And I spent some time on one of these programmes uh, last year, which I found a, 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 a richly rewarding experience. And in talking to um, head teachers and aspiring head teachers who are involved in that, they certainly fed that back to me, and the evaluation supports that as well. So the, the, the investment in leadership is very important, and we do need dynamic people like Nancy Clooney. And I think what I'd reassure Mr Adam about is that there are other people like Nancy Clooney in other parts of the country who are dem demonstrating that vibrant leadership. And I think what has helped that process is that pupil equity funding has given a means and a flexibility to enable that to really reach a new level. And Scottish education is benefiting as a result of that. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Joanne. Yeah, um, thank you very much. I do want to just raise um, an issue around uh, pupil equity funding. My sense is there has always been innovation in, in Scottish education and what some people are now doing, they're getting the opportunity to fund these innovative ideas and some of them are, are things that perhaps have fallen by the wayside in the past for the want of funding. But I'm sure you would agree with me you'd be concerned if public um, pupil equity funding was being used to substitute and fund something that would have been resourced through mainstream in the past, but has been cut. And I want to give you a particular example, which is, you will be aware that Dundee City Council has ended its in-school swimming lessons. Um, and we can have a separate argument, and it's not my place to decide whether that in itself is a wise move or not. But a Dundee City Council spokesperson said, head teachers have been given the opportunity to explore how swimming lessons can be delivered through the Pupil Equity Fund and Leisure and Culture Dundee's Family Swimming Initiative. Do you think that is an acceptable use of public uh, pupil equity funding? No. And does that mean there, if that were done, you would, you would, um, you would, it's your responsibility then to go in and say that's not a condition of grant and would remove the grant? I'm interested in the process. Yeah, that's, that's exactly correct, because what, if I can, put some background. My officials have spoken to Dundee City Council. I, I, I suspected this would, this would emerge in our conversations this morning. And the City Council, um, in dialogue with head teachers, has looked at the provision of swimming licence. And swimming licences are very important. It's a, it's a life skill which is important, but it's not prescribed within the curriculum. What we prescribe is two hours of substantive physical education per week for every pupil. Now, the, the, the view that was taken within Dundee was that to obtain a 20-minute swimming lesson, young people were missing out on learning and teaching for two hours. And the judgment was this was not... At a time when we are pressing to enhance learning and teaching, the judgment was, locally, that that was not the best way to use two hours to get 20 minutes... Two hours of learning and teaching time to get 20 minutes of swimming lesson. That's a judgment that's there to be made. What is not acceptable, and we've made this clear to Dundee City Council, and, uh, and this point is accepted this morning, that um, is the guidance that Joanne Lamont has read to me, that if a school wants to use pupil equity funding to go and do that, that would be acceptable, because it's not. So I hope that helps to put into context uh, where this issue has come from, but also what the judgment would be about the utilisation of pupil equity funding for essentially um, a replacement of a, a service that was there before. I wonder if you regret Ren, the ending of the Scottish Government's uh, swimming lesson fund that was di directed towards deprived communities and regret the cuts to local government, which meant perhaps that the local authorities meant to do that. I don't know whether that you think is an issue, but can you maybe explain to me if there were another example of this 
where somebody looks as if they're using pupil equity funding in a particular way that you don't think is within the spirit um, or indeed the conditions of the grant. Can you talk me through the process? Because you've said it's about the school and the head teacher in the community. It's about the local authority. I presume you just mean really in accounting terms to manage the money. Where is the judgment being made? Because you've now said that you have made a judgment in that decision. So it wasn't, even if the head teacher wanted to do it, it would be unacceptable. So where does, what is the mechanism for both that judgment being made and being relayed to the local authority and to the school? Well, all, all of this is set out in the guidance, which makes it quite clear that um, pupil equity funding must be used for additional purposes, not replacement. So the, the point comes back to condition of grant, which is that anybody considering how to use the pupil equity funding must be mindful of the condition of grant and the guidance that goes with it. How does that mean? Well, ult ultimately, ult ultimately, we are relying here on the professional judgment of head teachers. That is the, that's the shift that I want to see taking place within Scottish education. We have leading professionals in whom we trust the responsibility to lead the education of our children and young people around the country. And my judgment is if we are trusting those individuals to lead the education of our children, we should trust them with a degree of budgetary flexibility over their schools. And so that, and we provide guidance for that and we provide um, the supporting um, assistance to enable uh, head teachers to make wise and considered decisions about that. Now, what I would say is there will be some things that are done under pupil equity funding that will not work. I accept that. And, and we just, we have to learn from that and move on to better use of the funding. But where there is an example, but what I would make a distinction about in my answer to Joanne Lamont's point is between something which is a breach of the condition of grant, which this would be for a placement swimming lesson, versus um, a judgment about something that I might look at it and think, well, I'm not sure that's the best way to do it. But if the head teacher thinks, well, that really is what my children need, I would tend to take the view, well, who am I to say, well, OK, I know better than you. And I'll make this the final point. I appreciate you want to move on. If we're trusting professional judgment and a head teacher tells us that what I need are support staff, a home links teacher, somebody who can work with, with young people. I used to have this. I used to have X number of learned support staff, but cuts have meant I no longer have them. So in that sense, it would be substitution to use pupil equity funding. Would you reflect on what those professionals are saying and saying perhaps what we do need to look at is how we mainstream resources through local authorities to schools so that they, they can do the things that they want to do that they believe is their core business but are no longer able to do and are perhaps then tempted to try and use pu pupil equity funding to support something that they know it works because it has worked but they can no longer do it. I think there's a, a number of points to, to make in response to that, and some goes back to some of the points that Joanne Lamont made in, in, in her earlier comments to me. Um, I accept that there has been a period of financial constraint within the public sector. I was the finance minister here for many years. I know the budget inside out. I know the financial pressure. We were simply addressing the challenges that came to us by the um, austerity programme of the United Kingdom government. Um, Clearly, we've taken other decisions which have resulted in significant increases in expenditure on education, which have come through pupil equity funding, Scottish Attainment Challenge, and also uh, through the welcome steps that local authorities are taking to increase expenditure on education. So all of these factors will play into the decisions that head teachers will make about pupil equity funding. But what I certainly think is really refreshing about the period that we're in just now is that head teachers have responded with enormous enthusiasm to the opportunities of the Scottish Attainment Challenge and pupil equity funding and are giving very thoughtful consideration to how that can be best used to meet the needs of young people. 
only game in town. It's the only funding they can access, and they can see the gaps in their own provision. And I think that, you know, certainly our experience well, well, as a committee is that it's what we're being told. People know what the challenges are, and they're working up with under constraints. But I accept innovation and an opportunity to try something that doesn't quite work works. But I do think I would urge you to look at the, the, the I think the more significant question, which is the inhibitions on teachers to do what and support staff to do what's the core business because of more than financial constraint, I think, a significant lack of resource. Well, I think the, the, if we look at the position you know, we've seen for certainly the last year, and I think probably the last two years, um, real terms increases in the funding allocated by local authorities to education, which is very welcome. And obviously we've put in pupil equity funding in the last... Um, we're now in year two of pupil equity funding. We're just going into year four of um, Scottish Attainment Challenge funding. So we're seeing um, that general increase in resources that are taking place. I think the point which for me is different, and I appreciate the, 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 the point that Joanne Lamont makes, that there has always been innovation in Scottish education, and I, I accept that. I think what's different in character about the impact of pupil equity funding is that we've given a signal to the head teachers around the country that we want them to really think creatively with their school communities about what is going to make the most profound impact on young people. And certainly from what I see around the country, uh, schools and head teachers are responding to that challenge, and Scottish education has been strengthened as a consequence. Tavish. Yeah, uh, Mr. Swinney, I wonder if I could just um, pursue the, the revenue point a little bit further. Um, you presumably read the SPICE briefing that was helpfully published this last few days about the reductions in monies available to local government over previous years. And so when you say a general increase in resources, d did you mean the, the £750 million which you introduced your remarks with this morning, or, or did you also mean and include that SPICE briefing, which obviously factually explains the position too? What, what I... You know, what I mean is about the combination of ex uh, funding such as pupil equity funding or the general allocations that are made through the budget process that are resulting in a real terms increase in the resources available to local government, which is a feature certainly of the 2018-19 budget of the Scottish Government. Um, yeah, I'm not going to bother with that. Um, let me go back to the £750 million. Um, you said that it's been, it's been available for this whole parliament. Is it therefore not possible to allocate it now for that whole parliament rather than the year-by-year -year allocations that you have undertaken so far? Um, well, if we allocated, for example, the pupil equity funding for the whole of the parliament, we would be locking in... Um, no change to the eligibility for free school meals, school by school. So we'd be locking in. If I was allocating it right the way through, I'd have, let's say, for example, I would just take the allocation this year and say, right, that's what you're getting for the next, uh, for 18, 19, 19, 20, 2021. 20, what that would not give me is any flexibility to take into account the fact that there may well be movement in eligibility for free school meals around the country allow um, teachers to be recruited on long-term contracts? I think anybody, I think the commitment the government has given to the availability of pupil equity funding as part of the Scottish Attainment Challenge over the duration of this parliament um, should enable um, individuals to be recruited for that length of time. Well, why then did the EIS tell us early, in an earlier session that there are 500 teachers employed directly through PEF but they're all on either one or two-year contracts? Well, I, yeah. In my judgment, I think it's a fair conclusion for anyone to look at to say the government's given a commitment to £120 million of pupil equity funding for this, the next and the year after. It would be a reasonable and considered public policy decision to recruit those teachers in a longer term contract. So you're saying head teachers are getting it wrong then? They're not putting those teachers on three-year contracts, which you've just suggested they could do? I think it's a reasonable conclusion to come to that with the... Con the constancy of that funding, those individuals could be recruited so and given contracts for that period. Fair enough. So your guidance, therefore, I presume, to every head teacher you meet when you're going around Scotland is please recruit these PEF teachers 
on long-term, sorry, not long-term, three-year contracts. Well, I certainly think that would be a reasonable conclusion, yes. So why do you not think they're doing it? Um, well, I, you know, that's the individual judgments will be applied. But I'm certainly not going to criticise people for doing that. What I'm saying is that there's a, a continuity of funding that people can rely upon for the duration of this Parliament. That's fair enough. If, but if there's a continuity of funding, then that presumes, by definition, there wouldn't be that much change in our individual schools' uh, allocation mm -hmm. over the course of that three-year period, would there? Well, I, I, I think in the light of that information, it would be reasonable to recruit teachers for that length of time. So therefore, there isn't much. There, there, there isn't much going to change in, a, in, a, in, a, in an allocation to an individual. Well, but, school, but, but, you, but Mr. Scott asked me two different things here. Um, I, I'm giving the, the te I'm giving the technical argument why I can't lock down the precise sums of money, because I'm quite sure if um, Mr. if I was to do that, and schools were to lose out, I would hear all about it because of movements of population. So I'm trying to respond to the actual circumstances schools experience. But you know, secondly, but, but there is a commitment from the government for that constancy of funding over that period. And I think a reasonable conclusion to draw from that would be to appoint teachers for that length I, of time. I don't time. necessarily disagree. I'm just puzzled as to why um, well, the EIS well, tells well, us well, as, as, as we often find here, Mr Scott and I are in violent uh, agreement with each other when it doesn't quite sound like it. <laughs> OK, one final attempt, um, as usual this morning. Um, given that uh, we're after, I suppose, assessing your policy prescriptions as to how they might affect child poverty, given that we've been as committed told that child poverty is rising, which obviously is uh, worrying in the, in the, to, to a great extent. Um, do you think it's appropriate... Well, but let me put it this way. Teachers are t primary teachers are telling me, is the right thing to do, or they're asking me the question, is the right thing to do to test at, at f a five-year-old's uh, numbers and, and reading skills uh, of kids who come from the most disadvantaged backgrounds, in other words, who are living in poverty, um, and they say, could we not have some more flexibility to get out of a testing regime when there are much better things we can do with our group of five-year-olds? Do you think that's a reasonable argument? Um, I think, obviously, I'm, I'm very um, sensitive to the argument about P1 assessment. Um, and I acknowledge the debate that's gone on about this point. So I'm, I'm, I'm taking very careful and close interest in it. So, um, and, 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 and I'm, look, I'm listening to what people are saying to me about this. Uh, there have been over 400,000 uh, uh, Scottish National Standardised Assessments undertaken so far. And um, I'm hearing some feedback about uh, the P1 assessments, um, but I'm not, I'm not being inundated with that. But you know, I'm very open to the question. The, I think we've got to get this into its proper context. The, the, the P1 assessment, if properly handled, um, will be a pretty straightforward experience for a child because it's not, you know, it's not presented in exam circumstances like the Scottish Qualifications Authority specialise in. Um, it should be done in a, in a very relaxed environment within the classroom. It should not take... Um, it, it shouldn't take any longer than 40 minutes, am I correct? 40 minutes um, as, uh, as, as an experience. So that's once a year. Um, now, I, I don't say that in any way to trivialise the issues because I'm very alert to, to, to these concerns. But one of the reasons why we want to do this is to give us, to help to inform teacher judgment about where young people's educational development needs the greatest amount of support. So it's to inform the professional judgment of teachers about how they can then deploy their professional skills. And then what it will help us with is to assess how much progress we are making year by year in closing the poverty-related attainment gap. Because I think what all of us accept is that the earlier we can make an impact on the poverty-related attainment gap, the better. It's why we're expanding early learning childcare. It's why one of the key aspects of the measurement framework for the closure of the attainment gap is the evidence that emerges from the 27-month vocabulary check that's undertaken by health visitors. It's an indication that we want to try to identify as early as possible what are the needs of children so we can address those needs so that by the time they get to being doing the primary four assessment, for example, that we don't find we've got a bigger gap to try to close than if we had been able to identify um, and inform the judgment of teachers about what would be effective in that early stage. Now, what, what, 
What was interesting, when I viewed the, um, the rollout of the standardised assessment, I did so with a group of teachers. And we worked our way through the P4 assessment. And then we were shown the information that gets portrayed about each individual child coming out of the assessment. And the teachers in the room with me were aghast at the quality, the fine quality of information that it highlighted about the strengths and weaknesses of young people as they navigated their way through the assessment. So they viewed that as high quality information to then inform what they would then do in their teaching practice to make a difference to those young people. So I think, so I, I think the, 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 that's why we're doing this, to give us the, the, to give teachers the information to better inform their steps to close the poverty-related attainment gap. But I am very happy to acknowledge that I'm sensitive to the issues that have been raised about the P1 assessments, and I'll listen carefully to the feedback that we get after this experience. Just one final point on that. I, I, I'm being told that teachers are in busy growing classes of five-year-olds, often in 30 and so on and so forth, are having to deal, uh, having, to, having to take an hour, not 40 minutes, an hour, to deal with particular children who are disadvantaged because by definition they may, may need more help. And that's the point. I, I can take all the rest of the argument. I think there's something in the round there. We have a different debate about national testing per se, but particularly for, for young children where it's just the challenge to have them in the class, mm -hmm. never mind to deal with a test. I'd be very grateful the Cabinet Secretary would reflect on that because I think there are some real issues there for teachers and by definition there for parents and for, for the people themselves. And, 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 I, and, I, and I'm very happy to take that, those points on board. And I think the, the, the point, specific point that Mr Scott has raised uh, uh, latterly on the impact on disadvantaged children is something that educational professionals should, be very, should take into account in the judgments that they take about how they proceed with, uh, with the assessments. Mm, okay. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mary and then Julian. Convener, I've just got a couple of um, brief questions because a lot of what I wanted to ask has, has been covered. I want to very briefly come back to um, the question that Tavis, Tavish Scott asked you about recruitment of teachers using the additional funding that, that schools get. And I want to be really clear. Is the guidance that the head teachers get on how they can use the funding the same guidance that is given to local authorities? Because I um, have evidence of a head teacher wanting to recruit a teacher and being told by the local authority that they are not allowed to do that. The guidance that's available for the implementation of pupil equity funding is guidance jointly agreed between the Scottish Government, the Convention of Scottish Local Authorities, the Association of Directors of Education in Scotland and Education Scotland. I think that's all the, the players involved. Um, and the uh, local authorities are able to, um, you know, if there's particular uh, local dimensions that they feel need to be highlighted to, uh, to schools in their area, they can do that in a complementary fashion, but not a contradictory fashion to that guidance. So if a head teacher wants to take a teacher the local authority should not say to them, you are not allowed to do that? Um, the, uh, that's correct, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. That's there should be no impediment to a head teacher. If a head teacher wants to employ a teacher, um, there's Using the funding? It's perfectly all right. Okay. That's, that's uh, very helpful. Um, the, the other um, concern that has been raised around PEF is the lack of knowledge and support that's available for head teachers through the procurement process. And it, it was raised in evidence by um, North Ayrshire Council, and it was also raised by Aberlour that um, head teachers, when they, were, when they are given this funding, are, are almost automatically expected to be able to navigate their way through the procurement process. Um, I mean, would you say that that's a fair reflection of head teachers? And how will you make sure that they are properly supported when they go through the, the procurement process to make sure they get the best value and the best use of the funding they're given? Well, this, this, this is new territory. So inevitably, there's a new ground to be covered by individual head teachers in acquiring the skills that they need to have to, uh, to take these decisions. And we've done um, a series of events with head teachers. We did them in the spring of 2017, and we've done them again in the spring of 2018 to 
discuss all the issues arising out of pupil equity funding, and these have been really well attended, um, involved discussions with head teachers around the country. Um, obviously, you know, one of the reasons the decisions I took was that I didn't, um, I didn't want to send out two and a half thousand bank transfers to individual schools, because that would then involve those schools establishing financial systems, which I suspect if I'd come to this committee, the committee would have said, wait a minute, there's too much bureaucracy at local, at school level. So I took the decision to channel it through local authorities. But what comes with that is that there must be an observation of local authority procurement procedures as they, so that support from existing local authority procurement arrangements uh, is available for individual head teachers to make the decisions that they make. Now, I, I, I can quite understand that there might be a, um, a nervousness as head teachers are going through this because it is new territory, but I think the support is there to make sure um, head teachers are well supported. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Gillian, and then Ross. I mean, I'd like to bring the conversation uh, away from PEF, a lot of people have been uh, talking about PEF, to actual the impact of poverty on educational attainment and the root causes of that. Um, I'd like to ask, well, first of all, explain, I've been, we've been in a lot of focus groups. I've probably been about five focus groups with, with various um, stakeholders. And in every session, um, the stakeholders have said that there has been a noticeable increase in child poverty as a result of UK welfare reforms. And obviously, we are, we're feeling the impacts on that in our education system. We're feeling the impacts of that on our wider society. The UK government clearly is saving quite a lot of money with their welfare reforms. Has the Scottish government been given any additional money to mitigate the impacts of child poverty on a, a, attainment? Well, we, we, we get the funding allocations that come as a consequence of... Uh, UK funding decisions, but if the UK welfare bill reduces, um, but the exam instance of poverty increases, unless there is a consequential investment in public services in England that then generates a, a, a financial benefit for the Scottish Government through the Barnett formula, um, then no, we don't get uh, any benefit from that. We have a situation where we have more children that are going without food over the weekend or overnight and are coming to school hungry. There is, uh, as a result of welfare reforms or the, um, a situation in the household where they, they can't be fed. There is no extra money as a result of that coming into Scottish Government in order for us to be able to address that in our, in our schools. No. 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 Okay, thank you. Um, I want to ask you about the universal um, policies. So we've talked about PEF, but there are also Scottish Government universal policies that are actively targeting um, uh, the poverty-related attainment gap. First of all, early years provision. And also um, some of the, what might look like a, a micro impact of poverty, but actually has got a, a big effect, which is the um, increase of free provision of sanitary products in schools, colleges and universities. Could you give um, an assessment of, of the impact that some of those universal policies might have on the poverty-related attainment gap? Well, one of, the, um, one of the major drivers of the expansion of early learning and childcare, and we've you know, expanded early learning and childcare since we came to office, and obviously we're involved in a very substantive, uh, almost doubling of the provision uh, over the course of this parliamentary term, um, is to provide us with an even stronger platform to close the poverty-related attainment gap as early as we possibly can do. Um, and in that respect, uh, much of what I said in my response to Tavish Scott is relevant here. The earlier we can provide the support, particularly to young people who... Um, will not be getting the appropriate support at home, the better. Uh, so the, uh, the focus on expanding early learning and childcare is a, is a very significant part of that agenda. 
we obviously are in a position now that we have reached agreement about the funding of that with local authorities. I very much welcome that agreement that's been arrived at. And we're now actively focused on the implementation of this. And of course, as we go through this parliamentary term, more and more provision will move towards um, 1140 hours. It's not, it's all, not all going to happen in 2021. It will be happening as we work our way through the parliamentary term. So we will begin to see the beneficial effect of early learning and childcare on the closure of the poverty-related attainment gap. Um, there are uh, other interventions, as Julie Martin correctly identifies, around um, educational maintenance allowances, which we continue to provide in Scotland. It's a demand-led uh, budget, so uh, young people who are eligible for education maintenance allowances are able to uh, take those up um, uh, and obviously to support them while they're in their education. Um, and the availability of free sanitary products is, um, I think, a, a very important point because um, it might, the lack of money in a household to properly afford such products may be another impediment to a young person participating in education. And we, and the whole, the whole rationale of our policy approach is to try to overcome any obstacles that are an impediment to a young person learning. So whether that's about the issues of nutrition, so, for example, a school might decide that they want to put in place um, breakfast provision or even, I think actually, um, uh, I'd be surprised if um, Domanet Primary School, they, they were certainly running a breakfast club when I was visiting them, but they were contemplating, I don't know if they've decided to do this, is after school food for young people with structured play and with homework assistance so the school is maximising. The, the, you know, the young people were, had, had a joyous morning with them taking part in a structured play, which they provide for young people along with breakfast before nine o'clock in the morning. So the young people are in the school at eight o'clock in the morning, breakfasted and involved in structured play to get them ready to be able to start learning. And then they were contemplating um, extending the school day with structured play food and homework before the young people went home at night, all to try to address some of the wider context that was undermining the educational achievement of young people. So we have to be open to these uh, these interventions. Um, I want to bring it back to the, the issue yeah, ar around um, sanitary provision. Free, I, I'm, I'm very clear on this, that free access doesn't just mean free products, it means not having to ask for them. So when you have a situation where you have um, a local authority like North Ayrshire, who for the last eight months have been, uh, have got free provision in all the, the toilets so that the, the uh, young women and girls do not have the stigma, the double stigma of having to ask for them, but then you have another education and another local authority which retains the status quo where they have to go to a school nurse. That's a barrier to their education. What can we do in this place to ensure that they've got good practice going right throughout the whole of Scotland? So I'm being very clear, Aberdeenshire Council Education Committee has made a decision to retain the status quo where girls and young women still have to go to a staff member in order to access products that they're getting um, that, that should be freely available. When you don't have that parity of, of barriers being taken down throughout the country, what can we possibly do to influence and, and, and to, to get them to overturn those decisions? I suppose some of this comes into the territory of the, that we wrestle with quite frequently about um, individual approaches being taken by local authorities and what is the rationale for there to be some form of... Um, a national approach that, or a, a consistent approach that's taken in every part of the country. And and there will be arguments for and against on different issues. Uh, on this particular issue, you know, I'm very sympathetic to the point that Julian Martin makes about the essentially the discrete provision of uh, these products so that young women are not embarrassed um, uh, by... Uh, the, 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 the having to, to go through some difficulty in gaining access to, to sanitary products. Uh, now, this is obviously an issue which has been actively taken forward by uh, my colleague Angela Constance, the Cabinet Secretary for Communities. And part of that will involve, as we often are involved in these discussions, 
um, a collaborative discussion with our local authority partners to try to get to an agreed uh, model of best practice which can be taken forward. And you know, we take forward these discussions on a regular basis and I, I'm certainly um, aware that those discussions have been taken forward by Angela Constance in this respect, not just in relation to schools, but also in relation to colleges and universities as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ross and then Liz. No. I recently released some data showing that the ratio of additional support needs teachers to young people with uh, uh, identified additional needs had moved from 1 to 18 to 1 to 55. That's partly because the number of young people with additional needs has risen, but also because the number of those ASN teachers has fallen, I think, recently by 100 full-time equivalents. In response to that, the Scottish Government said that it was inaccurate to single out support for learning teachers. Uh, why is that the case? Does the Scottish Government not recognise the specialist support that they provide? Uh, no, um, because I think the, the answer is in the sense the earlier part of Mr. Greer's question to me, which is about the um, the expansion of the number of young people who are identified as having additional support needs. Because what the definitional changes that were undertaken in 2011 did was to expand significantly the range of um, circumstances that may suggest that a young person has additional support needs and there will be a broader range of members of staff providing support within schools um, to, to such young people. I would understand that answer if the ratio had simply risen because the number of identified young people had increased. It's also because the number of specialist ASN staff has fallen. Do you recognise that it is not fair for classroom teachers in particular to place an expectation on them to provide the same level of specialist support for young people with complex additional needs as a specialist additional support needs teacher would? It, de it depends on what particular needs um, are being supported. Um, let me give Mr Gray an example of this. Um, I was in yesterday Clydebank High School uh, in the region that he represents and um, I saw um, some very good work that was been undertaken, uh, which was in the field of nurture, where all of the young people that were involved um, had identified additional support needs. But their needs were being met in a very focused fashion to um, enable them to access their education. The, those the, the, the degree of specialist support that was, they did not need a particularly um, detailed level of specialist support. What they needed was assistance to help them to overcome some barriers to learning. Now those staff undertaking that, a, delivering that intervention, which certainly from what evidence I saw yesterday was um, really very compelling in its effect, um, those staff would not be captured by the traditional definition of um, additional support needs staff. So I think fundamentally what this comes back to is being satisfied by whether or not we are fulfilling our duties in terms of getting it right for every child. Are the needs of every child being met as part of their participation within the education system. And that is a child-by-child -child judgment that has to be made to determine whether or not the needs of a young person can be satisfied within a mainstream school, and if so, what support is required. But if they cannot be have their needs met within a mainstream school, then we have to be open to alternative provision. And of course, there is a range of alternative provision that's available in that respect. The uh, report that this committee, the, the inquiry this committee completed on additional support needs some time ago now shows quite clearly that we are too often not meeting the, the needs of our young person. But I'm still not entirely clear exactly what it is that you're trying to convey here. Are you suggesting, Cabinet Secretary, that the 100 full-time equivalent additional support needs teachers that we've lost simply weren't needed? No, I'm trying to say that there will be a broad range of staff who are involved in supporting a more broadly defined group of young people with additional support needs within Scottish education. That's what I'm saying. I think the loss of these ASN teachers has had a negative impact on the support available to young people with additional needs. Well, that should not be the case because... But has it been the, the case? The, well, the needs, the needs of each young person should be assessed to determine whether or not their needs have been met within the education system 
And there is, of course, a whole series of mechanisms that can be available to test whether that is the case, including the Additional Support Needs Tribunal, which is ultimately there to hold the public sector to account on the judgments that are made about whether or not the needs of young people have been properly met within the education system. Do you recognise the findings of our previous inquiry that too often the needs of young people with additional support needs are simply not being met? Well, I certainly um, I look carefully at the evidence that the committee gathers on these questions and I um, actively uh, encourage local authorities to fulfil their statutory duty to determine what is the what steps they are taking to make sure they fulfil their statutory duty to meet the educational needs of young people. And briefly on another point that uh, we explored in the earlier session with Education Scotland, if in the course of an inspection of a school the inspectors find that uh, young people's entitlements under curriculum for excellence, such as to personal uh, support through their education, are not being met, and that's quite clearly due to understaffing or under-resourcing, would you expect that to be clearly stated in the inspection report that those needs are not being met and it is because of understaffing and under-resourcing. I would expect that to be reported, yes. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Gillian, would you want to come back in on the third sector stuff? No, right, okay. Well, in that case, can I uh, bring this session to an end and thank you very much for your attendance, Cabinet Secretary. Can I also thank you and everybody else who's appeared before the committee to give evidence on the attainment and achievement of school-aged children experiencing poverty inquiry. That brings us to the end of the public part of the meeting. We'll now move into private session and I shall stand for a moment or two to allow the witnesses in the gallery to leave. <laughs>